All right. And now we should be live. Hello, everyone. How are you guys doing? Yo. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this great Wednesday evening. Very exciting to talk nerdy shit. Hey, there it is. Okay. I was just, oh, no, I've got the Twitch ad. Um, oh, and. Just make sure to bring down the volume on your end so that we don't hear it. Okay. It is a cool beard. Ah, it is there we a go. cool beard, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and I forgot to turn off my cell phone zapper, so I'm going to do that real Here's quick. Zapper. Uh, <laughs> notifications. We're going to sit here and watch Chris figure out technology real quick. Okay, it's off. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it wouldn't be dinging. All right, uh, I, so the two I, have, I have two people that text me, which is my wife and my friend Kyle. Uh, and they both know I'm doing this, so hopefully nobody's going to text me. Um, but you <laughs> they know, can hold off for an yeah. hour. We're going to be talking about important yeah. things like <laughs> history and comics, <laughs> all of the very urgent matters. Hi, Steffi. She's been a regular in a few streams. Oh, wonderful. Uh -huh. So what are we up to today? Who, me or the folks on, on there? You. <laughs> um, well, I was wrapping up. I did a, um, a Kickstarter uh, about a month and a half ago for uh, these wooden figures. It's a thing I, I started doing um, uh, where we're going to do uh, literary figures, historical figures, things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, it was supposed to come with a PDF, which I thought would be the quickest part of things, but the figures are all done. They're all ready to ship out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still hadn't finished the PDF because it needed to be heavily annotated. And it wasn't just the usual annotations that I do, which is go in and give my thoughts about stuff. It was, I was having to reference a lot of quotes from Sherlock. It was uh, Sherlock Holmes characters. And so it was a lot of uh, going through the book, mm -hmm. highlighting stuff, things like that. So. And I've been that, that PDF was like, together. it was in, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. It was like in this general style, if I remember correctly, from your Patreon. Let me glance. I'm waiting for it to load up real quick. My computer is wheezing yeah, well, right now because it's here, trying I've, to juggle like 15 programs at once. I'll grab them and show you real quick. Oh, fantastic. Uh, So, so here's the display for them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just a bunch of uh, characters from the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and they're all about uh, this big. So these aren't the Sherlock Holmes characters. These are from an author set that I'm doing coming up. So here's Dumas. Here's Rosemary Sutcliffe. Um, uh, Yuzai Yoshikawa. Folks That's like that. Fantastic. So I'm um, just little wooden things that I've got my drawings on, and uh, folks can put them on shelves and things like that if they're enthusiasts of whatever the subject matter is. So anyway, so I was working on the PDF for that, which uh, my wife gets home tomorrow. She and my daughter have been on a, a family vacation with mm -hmm. uh, the other ladies in the family. Um, and so she'll proofread them when she's proofread them and pointed out the 75 errors I've made per page. Um, <laughs> I'll send it out to the Kickstarter backers. Does she often help you uh, with writing? And does she like collaborate with you ever? She does when I think to have her do so. Like the, mm -hmm. basically every single poster that I make um, has at least one prominent error in it. Sometimes I misspell <laughs> the title, um, which is tricky because I do all the text by hand. Uh -huh. um, so. Uh, yeah, so so ideally, I think to do it in time to send it to her, but usually I'm real eager to post something as soon as I finish it, and so I put it up. You want that instant validation from yeah. an artist. It's so, the hardest thing when Twitter's right there, and it doesn't matter if it's like 3 a.m. and you finish the sketch. You're like, I have to, I have to show the world what yeah. I've done, I've created with these hands. <laughs> yep, so I, so I, uh, I 
I tend to do that. So if I think to, uh, she'll proof stuff for me. And then also, um, she, when I'm, when I've got a, a deadline heavy project, so, so not for, uh, posters or illustrations or things, mm -hmm. but for sequential work. So whether it's a graphic novel, whether it's a monthly, whatever it might be, um, she will usually flat the main characters for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, she's got Photoshop on her laptop. Um, I will uh, send um, uh, the. Uh, I'll answer some of the text things in yeah, a second. Yeah, people are uh, very curious about our rooms. Maybe we yeah. should do a little bit of a studio tour. Um, okay, doke. Um, so, uh, oh, uh, I'll I'll give her a sort of a simplified character palette. Um, mm -hmm. Just a drawing that she can eye drop uh, of whoever the main characters are. So Mars attacks. It was. Uh, a Martian and then the two leads um, for the creeps it was the four kids for Roanoke it was um, uh, the two narrators and so she'll go through the entirety of the book and color those guys and so I'll mm -hmm. still if they have patterns on their clothes or things like that I'll still need to go in and put those um, but just that little bit saves you know 15-20 minutes per page and on a 200 page book that so adds up bit, um, yeah yeah, and it's just the, the monotony of it, and so she can do it while she's hanging out with our daughter or watching TV or something along those lines. And so uh, it it keeps it to where I'm I'm doing more of the thinking work, which is yes. really nice, and I'm real grateful to her for doing that. And as a result, I can work on a really tight deadline if I have to. The first mm -hmm. issue of Mars Attacks, I think, because I was finishing up, I wanted to do the project. They wanted an October release because it's vaguely spooky. Um, and so, but I had to finish the nonfiction book I was doing for first second first. Mm -hmm. So I ended up only having 13 days to do, to draw and oh color God. the 20 page thing in the cover. So that was, 13 it was real days. Yeah. And then another one I did in 10. So it was not, not my ideal. <laughs> I want to take longer than that, but, um, I'm having anxiety from hearing that yeah. kind of deadline from here. Like I, I see you've survived it. But, well, I mean, oh and it was gosh. tough, and I kind of gave my, I, I was, uh, it was a little tight on my hand, um, uh, which isn't, I, and I don't like deadlines like that. I can usually make them work, um, but sometimes, and I'm, I'm getting better about it most of the time, but if there's, if there's a project that I really want to do, and it has to be done on a, on a deadline, like, that is unrealistic, I'll still about half the time take it because I really want to do that project and just sort of hope that I can muddle through. So I had that same issue just this weekend. Uh, there was a project that I felt very, very important. I thought it was a very important project. It wasn't um, a kind of project that, not to you know stroke my own ego, but not a lot of other artists could take the job, not just because yeah. of like, you know, my drawing skill, but it was like who I was in certain communities that allowed mm -hmm. me to do the work. Uh, and even though it was the most insane deadline I've ever said yes to, I finished an entire book cover in 24 hours. That, yeah, and that is like with sending in sketches, with waiting for feedback, I'm oh, like, oh. I need to get this done. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was it was nuts, but um, it was I, I definitely relate to that. It's like every everything as a professional in me says say no, and everything yeah. in me as like an illustrator is like say yes. Yeah. So why don't we do a little bit of a of a studio tour? Why don't you show okay. people what what you got behind you? Okay, um, uh, way off in that corner there, I've got a wall. You can kind of see a little bit. Um, it is uh bunch of and this this runs both sides of the hallway um uh paper figures that i do i like to basically draw things that i wish existed and that i wish i could buy and um so i don't i don't generally speaking put up any of my finished drawings uh on my own wall like i don't have any uh posters or prints or anything like that although i am going to hang the hunchback one downstairs eventually just because mm -hmm. it it's real big and pretty and they did a nice job on the on the the screening on it mm -hmm. um but uh, I do really like to surround myself with stuff that I like and a lot of stuff that I like you can't necessarily buy and so I make it and so that's what that hallway is for. Um, I've got uh, a, a big Usagi figure over there. Somebody mentioned that in the uh, thingy. Um, oh. <laughs> what did you knock over? 
I forgot I put that Schweitzer craft thing there, and so I clipped it. <laughs> um, uh, so this is the the Ninja Turtle figure that came out last year, and it's just real big. And Usagi's one of my very favorite comics. You I think. interviewed the creator behind it, didn't you, at Heroes Con? Yeah, a couple of times. So I did uh, about ten years ago. Um, I was lucky enough to be in. There was a comics journal uh, issue, the Big Three Hundredth issue, which was a um, a mix of conversations between newer creators and older creators, mm -hmm. and it was all real big name people except for me. Um, and so it it was nice because I just started, and it sort of gave people the illusion that I was more important than I was. Um, Isn't which that all of illustration? Yeah, <laughs> I was tricked right. into thinking I was important. <laughs> Um, so they, they paired me up with Stan, and I met him in Boston. We were both doing, a, a, a I think, a, like a library a librarian conference up there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the first time I met him, and he was just a wonderful guy. And so I got to – it was it was really neat because I, I was already a big Usagi uh, admirer and, and reader, and it gave me the chance to – have excuses for asking a whole bunch of nitpicky questions on my first meeting with somebody. Um, <laughs> the number one uh, thing you're not technically yeah. supposed to do when you meet your heroes. I feel so, like it's a, it's an unspoken rule, especially in Comic Cons, which is how we got to know each other. It's, yeah. you know, you meet somebody and the number one rule is be cool. Just be as cool <laughs> as possible. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're coming in as, you know, a fellow peer. So you don't want to be starstruck and you don't want to throw a thousand questions at them, even though you really, really do. <laughs> yeah. So that, was, so that was really nice. And we, you know, we, we keep up since we see each other when we're at the same shows and things like that. And so this is the first time that he had been to Heroes Con, at least since I started doing comics, maybe ever. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and so I was able to do a sort of a catch-up talk with a lot of the stuff that has changed since then and some other things. And I, I recorded that one on my phone, and the audio came out real, real rough. Oh, so no. it, in theory, it's transcribable, but not really postable. So eventually I'll get around to maybe sending it to somebody to transcribe um so it can go up for posterity's sake because it's you know any any I, I feel like he's just a font of wisdom and i love I, I love visiting with stan and learning from stan and um oh so other stuff in the uh in the studio i've got yeah violin um my mom's a violin teacher and she gave that to me a couple of years ago and so can you um I'm, uh, not well uh i can scratch something out on it real quick. see guys we got art we got music. <laughs> what else could you ask for? Yeah, that that kind of thing. So, not uh, it's it's real scratchy. I'm I'm very not good. Um. But I like fiddling around with it. No, you no like pun. fiddling? I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. As soon as I said it, I realized <laughs> it was a terrible mistake. Um, and so then I've got pipes over there, and I don't smoke them very much anymore, but I still like them. Um, you do got have them for the player aesthetic. Some, pardon? <laughs> you have them for the aesthetic. <laughs> I have them for the aesthetic. I still, I mean, uh, a couple times a year, but it's, it's infrequent. Um, and then some of my books are up here. So this is... Uh, horror fiction that is uh ancient world nonfiction picture books mm -hmm. uh, americana music stuff um uh film study scripts uh some historically graphic novels that i really like uh anyway just sort of uh, do you have that around because it's just like this is my space this is where i put my stuff or do you actually like like to regularly pull them out um, I, these are up here because I tend to pull them out more frequently. Uh, I, I change out a few of the shelves with some of the down, most of the books are downstairs. Um, and then I've got another big bookshelf area over there. Um, but I, I tend to keep this stuff up here that I'm most likely to reference pretty frequently. And so I was doing a lot of ancient world stuff earlier. So that's why all of that is up here. Um, uh, the, the uh, the the film studies is down there. All the writing books and um, uh, language books, thesauruses, uh, word origin books, um, 
What's the word origin book? Uh, word origin books are um, basically just talking about. Um, I I don't have the big, the, the 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 real big Oxford dictionary, and nowhere mm -hmm. within about two hours of me has it, which is a shame. But it's like two and a half grand. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. That that's the the real good stuff. And I'm not a professor anymore, so I don't have access to academic libraries. So I don't have access to one anymore, which is a shame. But um, just uh, different. Different. Uh, a lot of them are specified, so it's like Western terminology, nautical terminology, things like that that I, I can use. But mostly, it's to try and find. Um, uh, mostly, it's to try to find whether or not words or phrases that I'm using in a period piece are uh, anachronistic or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I tend to to reference that a bunch. The three up there are some of my favorites. That's H. L. Mencken's uh, American Language, and it just talks about ways that uh, language changes over time. and And this is this is a thing that I tend to get real into when I'm writing historical stuff. Is mm -hmm. the syntax of a character's talk? Um, when I was in high school, I saw two movies kind of back to back. One was The Patriot. Um, and, and one was Rob Roy, and so um, and they felt like two very different uh, two different things. Like Rob Roy, really, the syntax sounded very period to me, um, and Patriot didn't. Patriot sounded very contemporary with a few flourishes to make it sound old timey, um, and it got me, uh, you know, at seventeen or whatever, really thinking about what it was that made something sound period and so whenever i'm writing a project um i'll do two i'll focus on two things one uh the degree of rurality of the characters like how far removed they are from an urban center because i tend to be i i've i lived in nashville for a little while i lived in atlanta for the better part of a decade but mostly i'm from the boonies mm -hmm. wherever i am and so um i tend to set most of my stories uh, in the boonies of whatever time period I'm doing and there are different ways that rural people talk versus contemporary people talk and that's true throughout history so um, so I look at uh, I read as many novels written during that era if there were novels um, uh, to get a sense as to what that sort of period flavor is that, that sentence structure and I try to incorporate that and um, we have the same agent uh, who's Charlie Olson um, and Charlie hates when I write things in period syntax especially for middle <laughs> nobody wants to publish it all I could think of was the fact that you know as fascinated as I am with uh, with that kind of thing it's not really relevant to the work that I do since I work you know primarily in uh, young adult fiction and yeah. so you have to make sure that it's understandable to the average 14 year old and you're essentially yeah. trying to create a story for the average 14 year old so mm -hmm. If they don't understand what's happening, it's no, not going to work. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I, I, I worry that we're skipping yeah. ahead a little bit. Uh, so oh no, no trouble. Uh, a lot of people, uh, so a lot of people know that we're having this art talk today. You know, the very originally named art talk, uh, <laughs> because we want to talk about history, and that is essentially because when I first met you um, in March, you know, and I caught you in the past, in, in the last 15 minutes of Chicago Entertainment and Comics Expo, and I was like, you, I don't know who you are, and I've never seen you work before, but I need to go home with uh, this specific print, and I like harassed your table neighbor. But um, a lot of people in this, uh, in this stream might know you, but a lot of people might not. So why don't we start on the topic of history with a little right. bit of your own history. So you mentioned that you, know, you did grow up, in your own words, in the boonies, uh, but, and you mentioned that you were a professor at some point. So uh, why don't you give people a little bit of a background? Okay, so I grew up in, um, in Louisiana until I was 11, but I was in Central Florida a lot. My, my, all my extended family was there, and uh, this was back before the suburbs of Orlando were really, uh, you know, they still looked like they were shooting the Tarzan movies there that they had been mm -hmm. shooting a couple decades earlier. You know, my grandparents' road wasn't paved until almost 1990, so, mm -hmm. um, so it was real swampy and jungly, and I, I liked that a lot. There are alligators everywhere. Um, oh, my gosh. Uh, when I was uh, 11, we moved to Kentucky, and I've more or less been a Kentuckian ever since. So I leave, uh, but when I was leaving, you know, I still had family here. Um, uh, my family didn't really, my family didn't leave the area until shortly before I moved back to this this area. But um, 
I met my wife at Murray State University, where I went for my undergrad, um, and she's from the town in which we now live. Uh, so we we got married pretty young. She was uh, 22, I was 23. Oh, wow. Um, we'd been together for about three years at that point, and both had just graduated. Uh, we moved to Mississippi, where we ran a 160-year-old hotel. Um, I could not have predicted how that sentence was going to end. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, while I was down there, I realized that comics is what I wanted to do. Before that, I was kind of ping-ponging all around. I had zero idea as to what I wanted to do. And so, and everything that I looked at was kind of nutty. So, Were you drawing? Uh, pardon? Oh, yeah, I was drawing a lot. I never, I never wasn't drawing, but I didn't really have a context with how to pursue it as a career. I sent mm -hmm. off... Um, when I finished college, I sent off some samples to newspapers for a syndicated strip and got back, I think, one form rejection letter, and that was it. Um, and uh, I thought, well, I guess that's it. You don't, you know, they don't want it. That's wow. the end of the cartooning career. Um, and so around that time, I discovered... Um, uh, a lot of people's work online like i kind of stumbled across some uh some web comic stuff notably um uh jp Kuvert, Raina telgemeier um mm -hmm. uh a few other folks who were who were posting things around that period on a site that doesn't exist anymore but was called go comics um oh, interesting. Uh, mike mayhack was on there who does cleopatra in space um uh, the, a, hand, a, a bunch of the early scholastic people, actually, or the, the early graphics people. Um, and so some of them were posting these, like, two or three page comics, and I had never seen two or three page comics before. The first one I ever saw was uh, one by Raina about um, uh, reading Barefoot Gin. And it, it was this huge transformative experience for me because up until that point, every comic that I had seen was either a monthly or a comic strip or a graphic novel. Like the idea of a short story comic had never really occurred to me. And I thought, well, I could do a three page story and I did a six page story. And then that was the first thing I ever finished. And then I did after that, a like a 12 page story and then a 20 page story. And it just sort of steamrolled. Um, but I by the end great. of that, I think it's great that you started with those pieces by pieces. I feel like uh, a problem a lot of you know emerging artists have is that they'll try to do the 500 page omnibus yeah. in one go, and that'll completely discourage them. So I think whether whether you knew it or not, you were you were on the correct path. Yeah. I yeah I did I didn't know it at the time, but now I I sort of use that as as my my foremost piece of advice is start short uh, mm -hmm. if you're a new person because. Um, in addition to, I mean, there's the, the simple fact of being able to finish something and share it. Like, that's huge. Uh, it gives you a sense of approbation. It lets you, you know, get fe peer feedback. It lets you feel like you actually have accomplished something. It's a hit um, of adrenaline, unlike oh, anything yeah. else. I think that's what it is. Like, you get addicted to the creating and sharing process. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you can keep that momentum going and keep yeah. that that cycle fulfilling, like, you're all set. Um. So, so uh, I, by the time I finished that first comic, I was like, this is, well, part, I, I was doing those and I showed them to, I showed them to my dad and he looked at them and said, you know, you could do this for a living. And that was the staggering thing to me, not because my dad wasn't really supportive. He's always been really supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, but my dad works in the arts and has always actively discouraged everybody else from working in the arts. He's a oh, choral wow. composer. Um, and he's also, you know, would yet from the time I was, you know, 14, if I wasn't, if I didn't have a job, he would just be nonstop on me. And so the idea of, of having a non real job, like cartooning seemed real antithetical to what I kind of expected him to say. And so him suggesting that I do it for a living gave me this sense that, well, yeah, it wasn't so much permission. I mean, I, I would always do plenty of stuff that my parents would rather I didn't. But um, <laughs> it, it was this sense that somebody outside of me or Liz would look at something and say, this is a viable career option. Um, and so I was like, oh, well, maybe I could. And so I started 
looking into it. Um, I went to grad school for it at Savannah College of Art and Design Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, and that campus had just opened the year before, so it was a real small grad program. It was me and uh, Wukjin Clark and um, uh, Justin uh, Wagner, uh, and that was that was it. Um, oh, wow. And so, um, so we had a like one to one teacher ratio, which was great. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I loved the program, and I, I, you know, worked round the clock on it. Uh, Liz, uh, I was married at this point and had been for a couple of years, and so Liz worked while I was in grad school. Oh, before before I did that, um, I knew I wanted to go to grad school, but I had zero portfolio, so I uh, got a job substitute teaching, and then a. Uh, a teacher bowed out uh, for mental health reasons, and all of a sudden there was nobody to teach the social studies class. And in Kentucky, you can teach a class up to a year without teacher certification mm -hmm. as sort of a stopgap for this type of thing. So I became a social, sixth grade social studies teacher. Um, I very distinctly I remember that. like sixth grade social studies being like, that's when you know uh, you you love a subject. I feel like yeah. when you when you get into it in middle school. Well, that's the hope is that some of them got it. You know, I'm I I was uh, an idiot, and I'm sure I, I could I hopefully could do a much better job now. But uh, I like to think that it was in you know hopefully engaging for them. Um, I had you know zero curriculum or zero anything else that they just threw me in and was like teach stuff, and so I. I <laughs> I basically did a this day in history every day um, where I was like, October 12th. Well, guess what? On October 12th, 1231, this happened. Let's talk about that. Um, and so uh, so anyway, so so then I went to grad school. Um, while I was in grad school, I got my first book deal, which was for the first Krogan Adventures book, which was a pirate graphic novel with Oni. Um, and so I, I finished that up and finished grad school. That was in 2008. Um, and that one got a, an Eisner nomination, and then uh, I got um, a I got offered a teaching position at SCAD, um, and so I took that because I knew I wanted to teach, but I didn't know I, I liked the program so much. The idea of teaching anywhere else was kind of terrible. Um, and what is SCAD uh, for people who might not be familiar with? Some oh, of those I'm acronyms? sorry. SCAD is the Savannah College of Art and Design, and so they have a. Uh, they have an animation department and a sequential art department, which is the mm -hmm. academic name for comics, which I think is a little clunky. It feels like custodial engineer to me, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, it is what it is. And so mm -hmm. I, so I, I started teaching there and was there for five years teaching in the comics and animation departments, uh, while also publishing books and doing some animation work on the side, uh, design work. I don't actually animate, but I do. Uh, is it like uh, motion graphics kind of stuff? No, more like in, uh, environment design, like like uh, pr uh, production art. Um, oh, okay. So like uh, environment design, some character stuff, mm -hmm. um, some prop stuff, mostly environments. Mm -hmm. um, and so in uh, 2013, I think, which is, what's that, six years ago? Yeah. Um, I got to the point where uh, I, my daughter was about two or three and um being a dad and a publishing artist and a teacher were like three full-time jobs and I couldn't do them I could do two uh but my whole pedagogy was sort of based on professional work so like when we were doing class stuff we we talked as much about industry practices as we did about principles um and so sort of the 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 uh the antithesis of what I understand CalArts to be. Um, uh, and so, like, we would, you know, every, uh, we have Monday, Wednesday classes or Tuesday, Thursday classes. And so the Monday classes, um, they would bring in a news story from something that happened that week in comics. So either uh, something got published or, uh, you know, an acquisition got announced or this editor was, uh, you know, has been suspended for being a creeper or whatever oh, uh, and so it gave us an opportunity and we spent about the first it was a two and a half hour class and so we spent about the first 30 to 40 minutes of that class using those to springboard sort of mini lectures about the different publishers about the different people involved about different publishing stuff so that ideally when they got to the point where they were working professionally they had 
at least sort of a rudimentary understanding of what the publishing landscape was and what the industry landscape was. Um, and then on Wednesdays, they'd bring in a book that they had read that week and pass it around and everybody would look at stuff. And so it was a way of exposing everybody to new things. And so anyway, but a, a lot of that was rooted in me having a clear sense as to what was going on publishing wise. And if I was going to switch to just teaching, that was a big part, you know, that, that working professional aspect was a huge part of my teaching identity and I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and also I just really, I, I love teaching, but I like drawing more. And so when it came to deciding between the two, drawing went out. And so we, so I stopped teaching about six years ago and I've been doing comics and illustration full time ever since. I feel like there's so many uh, parallels between what you do and kind of like the stuff you enjoy and and I had a, a similar journey into it. it's like had no idea I wanted to do art had to have that like one person in my life be like wait there's something here uh, yeah. did the teaching that I was totally unprepared for at 23 I was a high school and middle school teacher uh, last year while in my senior year of college while in my like first oh. proper year of freelance so I would be <laughs> I'd be staying up until midnight finishing lesson plans for the next day sh waking up at five to go teach uh, then taking the train from where that private school was, heading into Boston, doing my night class uh, until 11 o'clock at night, catching the train home, and then like, so from 5 a.m. until probably like midnight, 12.30, I wouldn't make it back home. Uh, and that was, that's what I did for like a full year. Oh and my then, God. <laughs> what, were, you, were you teaching art or what were you I teaching? I was teaching, um, art, I was kind of like, they, they sort of let me do whatever I want which mm -hmm. was great so i had like a combination of like fundamental drawing plus i wanted to make it clear to them that like art was a real career that creative professionals like what that reality looked like so i had a lot of kids who you know would love video games and they love you know pixar movies so i would show them what it looked like behind the scenes like hey there are real people who are behind the stuff you love and you could be that real person someday it was a very um stem focused school very like science yeah. very uh ac academically rigorous too like from sixth grade they're telling you that you have to have like the right uh what do you call it gpa so that you can get into ivy league schools like it was very intensive so yeah. when i snuck in there <laughs> and i was like i'm gonna turn <laughs> some of these kids into artists <laughs> And now I'm actually so thrilled to say like just two weeks ago, uh, one of my 10th graders who I taught, she like sent me an email saying like, hey, could you write me a recommendation letter? Like, I want to go to mass art. I want to do fashion design. I was like, yes, success. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. I got one. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I, I, I try to dissuade everybody possible from doing this. Um, <laughs> I, I don't really. I say that. I'm just. I'm just. That. That's. That's more of a bit than a real thing. I. Uh, I mean, it's. I you that, have to be a realist about it. You do, and I. I think it, you know. It's. It's. Uh, the 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 big question is whether or not you want to treat it like a job or whether you want to treat it like a vocation. Mm -hmm. um, if you treat it like a job, it's actually not that bad. Um, uh, you know, you can get design work here, or there, or something mm -hmm. along those lines. Like, if you are compelled to create a job in the arts, is I think more more difficult than than getting another job and doing it on the side mm -hmm. um, until you are in a position where you can make money with it. Um, like if if your if your your goal is to be an illustrator or to be you know a gallery artist or whatever else to to work in a graphic design firm, I mean you'll you'll learn a lot, but it's gonna drain all of your creative energies doing these projects, and you won't be able to do those things that are sort of personally fulfilling. Um, uh, but if you like doing that as a job and you're able to turn it off at night, then then that's a great thing. So it's uh, it's finding that balance and finding where your your interests lay. Like for me, I can't I, I can't turn it off. Like I'm always doing something, and so it's that was going to be my question yeah. to you. I'm like, you can turn it off at night. <laughs> can no, you tell no. me how to do it? <laughs> Some people can, and I I've got I've got friends who do. Like they, this is something that they're good at and they enjoy doing, but mm -hmm. it's you know it you you treat it the same way that you would treat uh being a plumber you know um uh and i i don't think there's 
anything wrong with that at all. I think that that's wonderful. Like my, I, I really, I love making all this stuff and I love sharing info. Like I, I love the, the, potentially educational aspect mm -hmm. that art allows me to do like it lets me basically be real pedantic about historical stuff and share it and because there's a drawing affix like people will read it and that it still is has that teacher in you coming out yeah <laughs> i definitely feel the same way uh doing my my current graphic novel squire where it's mm -hmm. just like i want to speak to the children <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, and, and and uh I, I I told you yesterday when we were talking about this so I read I read your pitch for that and uh, you know looked at the designs and looked at your sample pages and I'm I'm real excited about it like how what what stage are you on at this point are you penciling are you doing page by page the whole uh, thing so as it is right now uh I I'm kind of tackling it chapter by chapter uh okay. and I've thumbnailed so right now I'm very focused on uh figuring out what the rest of the book will look like so I'm trying to solve as many of the creative problems as I can within the first chapter so that mm -hmm. when I hand it off to my editor I can be like this is what the rest of the book is gonna look like, uh, and then so that way I can get I can let my drawings become shittier and shittier, and he, he can't really uh, be worried, so to speak. So it's like yeah. making sure that they still have confidence in you and in your work. Uh, so so right now I've been sort of like laboring over um, the first chapter, kind of setting setting the tone for for how I wanna how I wanna tackle like character acting, how I wanna balance environments to you know. Um, environments to like you know the the more character focused panels uh, getting a feel for how how much fun I want to have with the lettering and like what's actually feasible so I've never done a full-length graphic novel fo before mm -hmm. so uh, right now for me it's finding out where my limit is and making sure that I'm a couple steps away from it so I don't burn myself out. I'm terrified of accidentally committing to like one style uh, or one way of drawing that will burn me out in six months. I, I, I mean, I understand that. I also, and, and I think this is the, the illustrator background that you have. Mm -hmm. the, the idea, uh, I mean, like I can make, you know, mild adjustments to style things. And I do for time periods. Like the mm -hmm. first, second books, everybody has dot eyes because I thought, you know, it's a skew slightly younger, and it'll be faster to draw dot eyes on everybody. Um, you pull up some of your work while you're talking so that people okay. can see um, what kind of style you might be referring yeah. to. Yeah, and I don't, I don't think I gave you any sequentials, actually. So this is uh, cool. so I'm just pulling up right now uh, yeah. some of your Patreon work. Okay. Yeah, so um, that people can get a sense of uh, it's just the one. Mm -hmm. The, um, oh, what was I... And say, oh, stylistically, like the the idea of being able to choose what style you're working in. Like, I can't do that. Like, my, I, I mean, there, there is a degree of rushness mm -hmm. to a faster project versus something that's a little bit smaller. Um, but by and large, like, all my stuff kind of looks the same. Like, regardless of what I'm doing, if I'm doing a pirate book, the drawing style is the same as if I'm doing a space book. Really? Uh, wow. So yeah, it does definitely come from an illustration background where it's like for me, I have to, I have to actively turn valuable. off my brain. Yeah, I yeah. have to tell myself like, and I think part of it comes with uh, being a digital artist and you know having this giant screen behind me where I actually refuse to zoom in because I realized, and I actually learned this while I was doing my pitch pages uh, that mm -hmm. you saw. Um, this is gonna, <laughs> it's gonna sound very like artist of me. I know a lot of people do this, but it's like, I'm a better artist now. You know, I, I'm not proud of those pages. I can't look at them anymore. <laughs> they got me my book deal, but I'm like, but I'm better now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one issue I had when I was working on them was I would zoom in way too much. So I wasn't actually looking at how the books would print out, you know, as an eight by five, I was looking at these pages, uh, you know, as if they were 20 inches by 36. Yeah. Uh, and that was a serious issue where I'm like, oh, I need to, I need to remember how people are gonna be interacting with the artwork. Um, yeah. And I think you don't have that issue working traditionally. You don't have that issue if you're a very strictly like pen and ink kind of person. Uh, but since I'm working digitally, it's kind of like that, that is the, the secret downside 
that you don't yeah. realize. Mm -hmm. What what I found helps me with that because I do a, a lot of stuff digitally these days. Um, and the thing that helps me is just putting a minimum diameter on my brushes. Um, and then that way I can only get so small. And so mm -hmm. even if I'm zoomed in, uh, I'm not going to be able to needle the way that I otherwise might. Um, and so that helps a lot uh, with that. But I also, I only use uh, the pencil tool in, mm -hmm. in Photoshop. Like the pencil tool and the paint bucket are the only two things I use in the lasso. Um, and every once in a while, I'll use a fuzz brush to do like a real mild gradient. But that's mm -hmm. like really, my, like on that picture you have there, there's probably a little bit of a gradient behind the girl in the second to last panel. Nope, there's not. Yeah. Maybe. For uh, me, it's like you, you have such great control over, over like panel layouts and compositions. And it's like, I can't believe that it didn't occur to me immediately. These are all flat colors. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what shows that like you're pretty you're pretty great at what you do. I see like a touch of a gradient here, but that's probably yeah. that's probably it. That's so cool. Well, thank you very <laughs> very much. Yeah, they're they're, uh, they're fun. I was real happy with how those those pages turned out. And I tried I tried doing traditional colors with them. I tried I worked with with Kyle Webster trying to figure out how to make mm -hmm. them look a little bit more um, watercolory digitally, and I ended up. Um, uh, I ended up liking the flat colors uh, more. I just it, when it, when I'm doing something where everybody's going to be dirty, um, mm -hmm. I've gotten real acclimated to working in watercolor where I can just splotch some brown on the lower half of their legs, mm -hmm. um, and I can't really do that as as comfortably in with uh, with digital coloring. Like I really, it's and I don't know if this is where you know just when I grew up um, or if it is. Uh, a purely aesthetic thing, but I, I don't like being able to see digital coloring technique. Like if I can see where a brush was at seventy percent opacity and it came over another brush, and you can kind of see that shift. Like there's there's something about that that kind of pulls the magic away from me a little bit. I um, think it's the curse of being an artist. <laughs> yeah, probably so, um, so flats allow me to sort of avoid that entirely. I, I have that issue where, you know, my friends who uh, are art enthusiasts, but, you know, not necessarily artists themselves, they'll, they'll try to send me a comic or, or something that they've checked out, and I get so distracted trying to pick apart and trying to analyze. So for me, I feel like my shift in what I enjoy is a little too heavily based off of, like, how I feel about their technique. And I yeah. wish I could turn my brain off sometimes because I've noticed this with myself before. I miss out on some really incredible stories because I'm being too much of an annoying artist about it. Yeah, I, there, I tend to have a very specific reading aesthetic that I like. Um, and that limits very much what I end up reading. Um, uh, which really, it's it's basically like five artists, um, mm -hmm. and then a few people that kind of look like them. Um, and uh, and yeah, it, it stinks. And then every once in a while, I'll read something that I wouldn't have read because somebody recommends it. And then I'm like, why, why am I being such a snob about art? Yeah. And then I'll go, and it's not even that art is not necessarily that, that the art I'm looking at isn't good. It's just that it's just I, that you're I, the jerk. <laughs> yeah, I'm the jerk. I want everything to kind of fall in this very specific wheelhouse. Um, uh, but I, I, I really like your art. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to Squire because <laughs> it, it, it pushes all my buttons. Like I'm not, as a rule, I'm not usually a big fantasy fan. Mm -hmm. um, n not for any... It's soft I mean, like, fantasy. It's historical yeah. fan fiction. That's, that, what that's, that's, that's what I like. I like... I like you know Robert E. Howard stuff where it's just it's it's historical fiction where you didn't want to do the research like yeah <laughs> I know that's a, I mean, that's, that's his his way of looking at it. I know that's that I, I don't mean that pejoratively when no I'm I a hundred percent understand what you're saying yeah, yeah. it's just like I want to you you're looking at you know real real parts of the world and you're going to be like this is my my new playhouse this is my new yeah. playpen and it's treating because it's all stories isn't it it's just stories yeah. at the end of the day um and <laughs> or more i mean just just generally speaking like however tightly you're couching something in uh, 
pe- people are going to read fantasy more likely than they're going to read mm-hmm. history. Um, and I've had, uh, and this this will go back um, uh, to a uh, to sort of the general theme of the the talk, but like. So I've, I've twice tried to pitch um, sort of Gangs of New York era things because I just find that period so fascinating um, for a variety of reasons. Like uh, thematically, I think it's really important to highlight it as part of the American mythology. Like right now, we, we really only have two things. We've got the Wild West, which is, uh, you know, our, our individual against all. We have uh, mobster stories version of dynastic uh, tragedies mm-hmm. um, and that's that's pretty much it in terms of sort of uh, historical genres that mm-hmm. we we look at through through this lens um, and I really want to see but but so much of America is about uh, under like under groups joining together for mutual survival mm-hmm. uh and i think that that tends to be the the story that doesn't have its own genre and i think that gangs of new york stuff the herbert asbury uh you know sensationalist newspaper stuff from the 1850s through the 1880s um that's where this comes from because it's so colorful and so and they're they're just these insane groups there's you know there, there's these guys that wear like ghillie suits and live in the sewers mm-hmm. there are these uh you know the, the this school for uh basically girl toughs that are you know hired out to whoever you know it's the the they're, they're called the lady gophers it's the mayhem academy the lady gophers, uh, the lady gophers. and so yeah so this this lady <laughs> battle Annie would um uh gr- would basically like bail out tween girls who had been arrested for this or that and agree to watch over them and would more or less indenture them into her fighting school um, and then would hire them out to strike breakers or to political rallies or things like that to run around and like slash people's ankles um, and I feel like they're, they're, anyway there's just but there's a gazillion of these types of things and I in my mind if you treat these like fantasy if you're like mm-hmm. oh are your gnomes these are your elves um and you know each group has their own little you know things and their outfits and wherever else mm-hmm. that people will read it like fantasy and that it'll be real accessible to youngsters and uh, every publisher that i've talked to about it is like no it doesn't work that way you know you can do adult historical fiction you can do uh children's non-fiction history mm-hmm. middle reader historical fiction like you'll sell three copies like it's it's just a dead market and that that bums me out um yeah i think it, it ties back to what we were saying before it's like you ultimately you try to do what you love what you love even if no one else is doing it uh yeah. and kind of the reason why we we came together today because it's like we're both big history nerds and also very aware that very few other people are in the specific way <laughs> that we are where i'm like i would sit down and read you know 700 pages of like historic <laughs> not even just not historical fiction i mean like straight up essays like yeah. dense essays in comic book form but i'm not gonna do it i even know that that work sucks yeah. um, but i would love to read it i mean there's a couple people who are thriving in those spaces and you have like joe sacco who does more he, he kind of almost does like diary entries of it or he mm-hmm. does I think the best way to explain it is on the ground journalism in yeah. comic book form, but he also does such a great job of integrating the history and kind of like tricking you into learning the history. Um, yeah. And but he like hides it under the flash of like I'm gonna go into this dangerous area. I'm gonna go into this area that you know a genocide has just occurred. Uh, mm-hmm. and, but I'm also gonna make you learn the nuances of the history behind it. Yeah. So I think it's like you said, a lot of it is is teasing it where people won't expect it yeah Mm -hmm. and that's and that's sort of the the crux of things so i mean there's there's a lot of upper basic so so the 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 trick with it thus far for me Mm -hmm. uh, at least logistically is that there are some smaller press publishers who will do the historical fiction but i i don't have a day job and we're a single income household and so whatever books i take on have to be cover our bill books and the smaller press stuff 
for the amount of time that historical stuff takes mm -hmm. doesn't cover the bills. So until I, once I have a, you know, a, a decent next nest egg squirreled away, like there is a chance that I may just do something on spec and kickstart it or something along those lines. But for now, you know, historical fiction is non-viable and historical nonfiction. Like I've, I've been doing that and I'll continue to do that, but it, you know, I like the, uh, I, I really like the act of crafting stories. I like the puzzling of it. I like the, the figuring out the plots and everything like that. And it's, it's hard to give that up. You know, I've done two, two, my last two books have both been nonfiction and mm -hmm. I, I, I really miss fiction. I just miss it. Mm -hmm. For me, I like the idea that the reason I, I go towards historical nonfiction, sorry, historical mm -hmm. fiction, is I don't want to be held accountable. <laughs> so yeah. there's always somebody else out there. My biggest fear is like someone else out there who definitely knows more about the topic than I do is going to kick down my door and be like, you are a fraud. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, that's my number one fear too, and it's it's uh, we get you know uh, I I don't know if you uh, hear or not the the uh, a lot of folks my age you know got real into the enneagram a couple years back, mm -hmm. um, which is like personality test type of thing. But mine, I took the little test, and mine is is rooted in that. It's is basically accumulating as many resources and as much knowledge as possible out of fear that people will point out uh just errors in your in your work and so that's you know i'm i'm i i get to be pretty obsessive about it and then it, it ends up becoming a, a problem because so little of it is shareable um mm -hmm. although through social media platforms and things like that um I can do, uh, you know, I can post some of that aside stuff, things that wouldn't necessarily make it into a book, but that I think is particularly fascinating. And so I can do a little, uh, most of the historical stuff I do these days tends to be through Twitter or through Instagram. And it's, I've it's pulled up some of your Black History Month drawings. So it's like these little snippets, these little bites of information and drawings that you have for people. So that, yeah, I'll yeah. do essay like, Little, little biography essays of folks that people may not know mm -hmm. um, to go into with the Black History Month stuff. That was because, uh, you know, we uh, when I was when I was teaching sixth grade, we had Black History Month, and you know, mm -hmm. the resources that I had were the same like six people that you talk about always. You know, it's, yeah. and it, it's almost exclusively uh, civil rights folks, mm -hmm. um, and that that's pretty much it you've got civil rights folks and george washington carver i think and, that's also tied to the fact that uh american public schools don't care about anything besides american history yeah. and it's not like yeah. they do american history well either which i find yeah, hilarious that's, that, that is that is agreed um uh yeah for, for being such a history buff i never i don't think i ever had a history class in all of undergrad that i liked mm -hmm. um but I, I think one of the things that makes it to where that I liked in history is that, you know, it was really easy to see myself reflected in these historical genres. You know, the, the if there's, you know, prisoner is into type stuff or if there's, you know, knights or whatever, you know, I'll, there, there's always a kid who kind of looks like me and I'm and I think that it, it's important to showcase that regardless of what your ethnic origins are, like you've got you've got people in those uh, in those fun historical genres, you know, and I, I look at fun historical genres as anything that Playmobil would make a set of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Wild West or Knights or Pirates or whatever else. And and there are so many folks from every conceivable background in all of these arenas and we just don't really learn about them. And then because we don't see them in Hollywood adaptations from the, mm -hmm. you know, up through the 80s, uh, we just assume that these folks weren't there. And so you, you, I mean, these days I think you, you see a lot more of it, both in film and everything. You've got folks like medieval people of color, like yeah. highlighting art examples of different people from different backgrounds in different areas. But I, I really wanted to do something that was specifically made for schools to print out and be able to put up. Um, 
and it show also that. comes down to it, it's like you have to get these kinds of stories in the hands of, of people when they're younger. You have to instill that little spark in them. And, and it's also, in my personal opinion, like it's a matter of confidence. Like you want to make sure that kids grow up knowing there is somebody like them out there and they're not they're not the first people to deal with those problems but also they're allowed to to dream and fantasize and have those kind of like adventure tales too yeah. uh, so and then there's that other layer when it comes to history where it's like not only is this super cool and fun and exciting it's real it actually happened yeah. uh and you come from you know a background you can identify with people who are that exciting as well uh, so allowing them to have that, that special connection they might not get, you know, in a classroom, they might not get from TV. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's like, I think, a, a big motivator of working in this kind of space. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and even for adults, like the, the you know, and I, I, the, there's no way to really go into this part of things without it sounding like self horn tooting, and that's not what I'm trying to do here. But it's um, all good. You know, go like, for with it. The, with the, you know, like with the the Black History Month post, for example, mm -hmm. like um, I got a lot of, you know, that that one that one got a whole lot of circulation, um, mm -hmm. and I got a lot of messages from people who were like, I wasn't really interested in history until now, and mm -hmm. that was that was so huge for me and i mean like if i get i say a lot you know like five but <laughs> it feels know, like, like a lot but those are the people who had the yeah. ability to reach out to you you know i bet you know five people actually took up uh the they put it on themselves to reach out and tell you how they felt yeah. about it and, but how many people saw it still felt that way and well, like held even, on to it yeah mm -hmm. well even that five or even one you know i mean like i'm a big I, I'm a big believer in that one person thing, you know, like if, if, if you, you create something that reaches one person and enriches their life, then it was worth doing. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, I think the historical stuff, I mean, like I, I love doing drawings and I love doing fiction. I do feel like the historical stuff has a, has the capacity to enrich someone's life mm -hmm. more than my fiction stuff does. Um, like uh, my fiction's fine. You know, it's, it's, C plus B minus. Uh, I don't know, I, trust I do, these ratings, but okay. No, I, I do my very best at it, but you know, I mean, none of them are uh, sublime by any stretch of the imagination. You know, they 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 are hopefully enjoyable reads that work for the genre that they are in, yeah. um, and so. They're not changing anyone's life any day soon. Um, not, not as far as I know, and I, 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 I very much doubt that they will. But I do feel like when I do these these little things and teach people something that they didn't know and get them excited about learning more and put getting them to where they want to go out and read something on their own um, and do more research, and that might lead to some other things like that. That's huge to me, and that makes a. A, a big difference um and so i you know so the, and that's part of why i do it is is you know wanting i get so excited about this stuff and i want to share it mm -hmm. and i also really like doing the, the research for it and trying to put it into a uh um uh, trying to put it into a form that's engaging and hopefully a little bit funny and uh you know just just makes you stop and you know widen your eyes like when you read it because there's there is just so much that gets glossed over, um, and and that, yeah, more right now. Even though you know my 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 bills are paid by books, my I feel like my my kind of primary mm -hmm. medium by and large is just posting these like micro essays mm -hmm. and throwing them out with with illustrations because that's where probably as much I spend about as much time on those as I do the books even though there's no immediate return I mean there, there's but there, there is an immediate return you're satisfied someone else yeah, out there yeah. is satisfied that's a return yeah. in itself absolutely mm -hmm. so, so regarding that like walk me through uh what does your process look like when 
uh, say you're, we're doing these, these pieces like I have pulled up here, you know, the, okay. the little tidbits of history. What goes into it? Do you pick like a genre first and then dive into the history? Or is it like you happen upon something cool and that forces you to go down a rabbit hole? Sometimes it's I happen upon something cool. Uh, most of the time it tends to be in, in sets, which is way too much time and work and it doesn't make any sense. And people would be just as happy if I posted one thing versus mm -hmm. posting 30 things from one set. But I do the 30 things anyway because I, I you know, compulsion. Um, but a lot of times it'll be a period that I think is interesting and I want an excuse to research it. And so I tell myself it's for a book, even though it's not for a book. And then I, um, will read everything I can find within a short amount of time on this particular period. Um, and I tend to be real, you know, method actory, but not in the sense that I, you know, wear costumes or whatever, but in the sense that I try to immerse myself in nothing but this. So the music that I listen to tends to be thematically related to whatever it is oh, that I'm okay. researching. Do you um, want to share those playlists? I don't, because I don't really know how. Like, for, for recent, like, when I was doing the Gangs of New York thing, I just went through and uh, went on YouTube and found a bunch of people doing uh 1850 songs on fretless banjos uh and just did an audio grab on all of them and just made a big playlist for myself um of that like hurdy gurdy songs um and so it's it, it's I, I i do sometimes make playlists after when a book comes out and i'll send that but you know that's uh kind of infrequent um so so you get into the music and so, so i get in i get into the music I, if there are movies rooted in these periods which becomes less and less likely like when i'm like oh second seminole war like there's actually like three seminole war movies but they, they you know it's not a lot i got i, I wanted to do lanchnik not long ago and there's like one kind of lanchnik movie and one novel and that's pretty oh, i listen to a lot of audiobooks fiction and nonfiction, both um uh but but i I do that, I, and I just start drawing stuff up, um, finding people that I think are interesting, um, doing that, and usually I can find something for each person. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a Pirates thing uh, around Thanksgiving, because Thanksgiving Day was the 300th anniversary of Blackbeard's last battle, um, <laughs> and so I thought it would be a neat thing to do like a countdown to Thanksgiving with all pirates, so I did a, a whole bunch of pirates, and uh, found out a whole lot of folks that I didn't know before um, uh, and that I had never seen in books. So I, I went through a lot of like uh, court transcripts and things like that. Um, there's a lot Where of good stuff. Uh, these days, most everything is, is digitized. Um, or I, I, let, me, let me rephrase. Like almost nothing is digitized, but so much more has been digitized than was digitized before mm -hmm. um, that you can stumble across a lot of things if you know kind of how to look. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I tend to look at a lot of like university uh, collections, um, a lot of uh, a lot of old books and old documents have been uh, transcribed. There are a few books that are, uh, you know, collections of primary source documents. I never used to use primary source documents and I've started to. They're so uh, dense. They're so dense. But the thing is, I mean, like e even primary source documents have this to a degree, but every bit of secondary source documents is um, has been curated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those curators miss stuff that I might find particularly interesting, but mm -hmm. which don't either they don't find particularly interesting or it doesn't fit the it's overall not relevant to what they're project. doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and so in stumbling across it, like in, in this one, I found out, you know, I was like, I wonder if there were any uh, North American Native Americans who are on pirate crews. And I found that, that Ned Lowe's, so I, I started looking at the list of these different pirate crews because they, 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 in some of them, they, they're broken down by race um, mm -hmm. specifically because a lot of times captured pirates, uh, the black pirates would be sold off into slavery. And so they had to... Just so I have the right image up, this is yeah. Planksgiving? Yeah, Planksgiving. So <laughs> here are some of the uh, the things there. And so, you know, I, I, so just in looking for that new... I found that there was a, a Wampanoag uh, guy in Ned Lowe's crew named Tom Mumper. 
Um, and so I got real excited. So I can pull them up. Oh wait, I found him. If you Ned scroll Lowe? down. Oh, okay. uh, no, not Ned Lowe. He's in Ned Lowe's crew. It's a guy named Tom Tom Mumper. Okay. Um, so he should be a couple below that, maybe. Let's see here. Um, but as you were saying, <laughs> sorry. There's a bunch of them. Yeah. Oh no, it's okay. Um, anyway, there's there's a whole bunch, and that I I they're all real interesting. Um, and so in in looking up these stories, like I'll find different things. Like Old South, I found a, a, all of his info just via via um, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh, here he is. Mm -hmm. uh, um, all of Old South stuff was through tes court testimonies. Um, about like which ship he had and things like that. I'd never seen Old South in a in a in a book, um, and so and that doesn't mean he's not in one. But I, I you know I can't even imagine how many pirate books I've read, and I've, I've you know, and a lot of these guys I haven't seen, and it, it's because they didn't necessarily have spectacular antics or things like that, uh, and they they weren't you know given their own chapter in the the notorious history of the pirates. Uh, but there's still like these interesting people that are worth pursuing and so um so that's become more more and more a part of my process is trying to find like the nashville public library i live about an hour and a half from nashville you know they've got like every issue of frank leslie's illustrated weekly and so you can go back to like the 1830s 1840s and find uh you know these that you know let's tour a brewery or whatever um uh and you can find this neat stuff through those through you know real estate maps all this different stuff um and it's easy to get sucked into the research of it and just the the love of the research of it and never actually have a discernible project like i've i've spent probably a year's you know over the past few years a full year's worth of full time work on gangs of new york era research mm -hmm. and have it is brought in like zero dollars um and you know so so you do kind of have to weigh your professional obligations with you know where when when is this a hobby and when is it informing your work i, I guess definitely, and where is the divide? i definitely struggle with that uh on my end part part of it is fueled a little bit by anxieties as an illustrator you know always feeling like i need more references i don't feel it, it's rooted in not being confident uh in your execution of a drawing i think part of it is for me uh, so i end up going like reference hunting and digging and researching and compiling and it's like and sometimes i'll throw them all on the same photoshop canvas and i'll like line them up and at the end of it i have maybe an inch of space to draw in the middle yeah. and i'm like i'm ready now <laughs> and oh, I, I had to i had to <laughs> practice i'm like at some point, I'm not researching with a purpose anymore. I'm actually muddling my idea because I'm always looking yeah. for the next thing and the next thing. And I no longer am researching with kind of like a focus, which is what yeah. you know, you're supposed to do technically. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I love it. I do very much enjoy it, but it's yeah. a time suck. Especially yeah. when the research is supposed to be for something with a deadline or for, you know, a graphic novel you're supposed to pass in, like, later on in the year. At some point, you just have to start drawing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I, I feel like so much of my, my illustration process and my comic drawing process is knowing when to stop. And yeah. sometimes when to start, where it's like, I have to say enough is enough. Like, move on. Yeah. Uh, oh, you're absolutely right. And that's, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm better. Uh, I say I'm better about it. I haven't done a historical sequential thing in a while, so I don't know if I'm better about it. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be, uh, there's a chance I might be doing something set in the seventies soon. And I, it's going to require a whole lot of specific technical stuff. And I, I know I'm going to spend forever on the, the, the research for that. Um, uh, or the reference for that, I should say. And so, how did you start getting good at, at researching? How did you start knowing where to look or how to look? Like yeah. what, what kind of key terms uh, do you plug in? So it's like if someone wants to <laughs> get into this after we spent like the past 10 minutes saying how it's a curse. Um, yeah. <laughs> if someone wants to get better at, you know, finding reference material and research, what what would you tell them? You're, you're 
first and most important thing is to not rely entirely on the internet because mm -hmm. although there's a lot of stuff that has been digitized and things are great, um, there are so many image heavy books that are just not available and images that are just not available in any digital form at this point. And mm -hmm. so going to the library uh, is hugely important. Um, if you are in a town like me with a very small library, um, you know, going to a nearby city library, finding where there is a nearby college and, mm -hmm. and you know, making sure that you have permission to go in and like go through stuff. Um, you don't need permission. Like, uh, you know, well, it, it, it depends. You, know, you just need to have a couple friends. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, and so just making sure that you, you are kind of going through the stacks of the stuff that you're looking at. Also, it's amazing how much stuff you can find unrelated to or related to something that you're interested in that are in books that are not about that. And so a lot of the the periods that I researched, some of the most interesting information about it didn't come from researching those particular periods. They came from researching other things. Like mm -hmm. I found, I found like the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the crux upon which a story would hinge, mm -hmm. uh, on like uh, the, the gangs of New York one I, I found in a wild West book, you know, which is, you know, 30 years and however many thousand miles removed um but it featured a, a character that happened to be in this in the gangs of new york mm -hmm. arena fulfilling a role that i needed exactly for the story you know um or you'll be reading something about the american revolution and it'll tell you something about the french and indian war that's mm -hmm. hugely important for the french and indian war thing you're wanting to do so the 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 biggest thing helpful for me is to diversify your reading to where you're not just reading about one given subject because mm -hmm. you're going to stumble across things related to your subject elsewhere. And then trying to track them down is kind of tricky. The, the big thing, and this goes back to what we were talking about with feeling like somebody's going to call you out for not knowing stuff, is making sure that I've got... Uh, evidence to support whatever it is that I'm mm -hmm. writing about. Um, because a lot of times you'll end up with like third hand legendary versions of stuff. And especially if you are dealing with, and the, you know, this was huge in the black history post, mm -hmm. you get so many people that are looking for one detail that you get wrong in order to invalidate the historical accuracy of your mm -hmm. supposition that there were people of color in this region or that region doing this or that, um, that you've got to be extra meticulous about making sure that everything measures up. And so trying to find period documentation of whatever it is that I'm, talking about or looking for is really important um but usually it's but i mentioned that uh you know going to going to libraries finding these these uh primary sources you really only know which primary sources you're looking for if you've read some sort of more general pop uh history secondary source stuff mm -hmm. um so i tend to start there and then slowly narrow my way in as i find what about a particular region that I want to do? But I treat it like a, I treat historical periods the way that some people treat genres. You know, if you get like a, a studio writer in the fifties and they're like, go, go write me a boxing picture, you know, like that's the way that I think about historical stuff. I've got no idea for this, uh, you know, uh, 1820s mountain man story, except for 1820s mountain men. Mm -hmm. And then I'll slowly compress that Build general vocabulary. Yeah, and then sort of, you know, tighten my net until I find the the, the particular story that I want to tell. Mm -hmm. Someone here has a really interesting question. Uh, they say, how do you all keep up with wanting to process and remember a large amount of information these days? Information retention is a huge struggle for me when it comes to nonfiction. Uh, the first thing that, that came to my mind was, one, if you're talking about it like information retention, uh, which seems like such a inorganic and and forced way of talking about uh, uh, talking about it. I feel like 
you need to reconsider how you absorb information best. I feel like everybody, uh, some people are audio learners, some people are visual learners, some people need you know both of them at the same time plus be active members in it. It kind of comes down to your learning style. So I, I like, for me personally, numbers mean nothing to me. I will never be able to remember any kind of date or any amount of numbers unless it like rhymes because I am a toddler. So. For me, when it comes to it comes to information retention, when I'm reading history, it's like reading a story. So, and I, I don't feel like I'm obligated to memorize it. I can, you know, put it aside and save it somewhere. Uh, but it also comes down to like, what am I trying to get out of the information? I'm going in there hopefully with a purpose. Uh, so, it's it's just very jarring to hear it as information retention. Yeah. I mean, I, I get totally where you're where you're coming from, though, um, because, uh, you know, I, I deal with the same thing. Like I can remember I I tend to remember the stuff that I think is important um, where I uh, where if something jumps out at me as being of consequence, like that will usually stick in my head or somewhere or another but one of the reasons why i've got so many books is that versus when i started is that i found that i couldn't necessarily retain the information i remembered what it was i remembered what book it was in but i couldn't remember the details i just remembered what i needed it for and that it was important and so uh, you know my my space and situation permits me to get a lot of books mostly secondhand um and i you know they are filled with post-it notes um if they are library books that i am unable to get for myself if i find a library book and there's more than like four pages that i need to highlight um i will try to find that book and get a copy of it um mm -hmm. and i will i will know and i'll remember where i need to look for the information that i'm mm -hmm. supposed to have um because especially when i'm trying to um if I do have to worry about that documentation, if I want to cite a source, or more likely than not, if my methods for uh, being sure, or if my standards for accuracy become more rigid as they tend to be over the years, um, when I look back on a previous thing, I want to be able to know where I found that information and check it against these sources or those sources. Um, so that tends to be my, uh, that, that tends to be my method is I try to accumulate the books. If I can't accumulate books, I will make Xerox pages of the things that are important and I will slip those onto the shelf next to the books on that same subject. And all my books are arranged in, uh, by historical era. Um, my books so are I, arranged by color. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that tends to that that tends to be my my approach is just trying to document stuff and put them in places that i can find it it's real hard to do with digital stuff like it's really hard for me to uh do that so i tend to print stuff out um i used to work at a university library uh at my art school so i worked at a uh, library that was primarily for art and design, which was incredibly lucky. Um, and then on top of that, we were part of the Fenway system. So that is a network of libraries in Boston. So I had access to Harvard archives, to Northeastern, to oh. Mass Art. So I had a gold mine at my disposal. Plus I was paid 15 bucks an hour, what's up? So, yeah. <laughs> but for me, the, but the number one perk, the number one perk was that I would print thousands of pages throughout yeah. my college. <laughs> So, oh, I, miss, I miss free printing access. Uh, yeah, now for me, the, the number one resource I have is the fact that half of my friends are MIT and Harvard PhD students. So they sneak me in very easily. So I've been doing like half of my comic work like in the Middle Eastern studies of, uh, of Harvard in like the middle of Harvard Square. So I'm just like so happy with that but yeah get your hookups anywhere you can be friends with yeah. the librarian they are the biggest rule breakers out there you tell yep. them that you're working on a project they will sneak you in any time of day any time of night <laughs> we had a question do you have a small network of people which can help you cross-reference and or check facts about historical events 
that you found out and are working about? And the answer is absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm real bad about keeping a, uh, um, keeping like a Rolodex of them. I have them tacked up around my studio in various points, and usually I hand scrawl on the back boats or uh, <laughs> something like that. And that helps me to, uh, to find folks. But uh, Twitter is really helpful for that. And mm -hmm. also, you know, there are, the other thing that, that is kind of nice is that with the exception of, you know, like big name New York Times bestseller history people, which they, they exist, but they're few and far between. But most everybody else, if you shoot them an email at whatever college they're teaching at, um, which most of them are. They will be uh, so excited to hear from you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, generally speaking, like answer you back or point you in the direction of what you need, which is nice. So uh, that's how I, I ended up uh, talking to like archivists at the the Harvard Middle Eastern Studies Department, where it was like the librarian in charge of their um, the I don't know what the actual word is, but it was like they were in charge of keeping the actual books not just like you know first oh, copies. Yeah, yeah. yeah those first edition books for mm -hmm. for so much of of the stuff that i used for squire so and yeah. there's only like a handful of um uh, of actual images that i could pull from you know from from ottoman era uh and earlier because what, what's tricky about i was dumb i picked an era of history to base my work off of that had no images to work with. <laughs> so oh, on, one right. hand, on one hand, on one hand, I'm not wrong, yeah. but I won't be right. <laughs> yeah, but in that stretch, yeah, there's like there, there's there's very little representational imagery. Yeah. So oh, a lot of oh, what yeah, I had to well. pull from, uh, honestly. So I, for a long time, I I have a strong dislike on principle towards uh, French Orientalism because you know it was it, European painters would go visit. Morocco and visit North Africa in Egypt and they would go and sketch tiles and horses and, and clothing and then they would come back and totally make up scenes that were sexually violent and misogynistic and just like terrible terrible scenes and they'd be like hello this is this is what the Orient looks like gaze upon it look at these wonderful savages so obviously on that principle I hated that genre but I had to go and dig them all up because as much as as much as they suck, they can really draw a carpet, and they can really draw yeah. some tiles, and it's like, oh, those texture references are so good. Oh, so that's, there, <laughs> that that's real hard, and that and that is one of the tricky parts is that a lot of times your mm -hmm. your bet you your best resources tend to be ones that kind of shudder you to do like yeah. like late eighteen early nineteen hundreds. Like I've got an amazing book set. Um, which is sort of pre-National Geographic called People of All, Peoples of All Nations. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's photographs of pretty much every nation talking about like customs and talking about this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but every single photograph. Now, to be fair, it is not only confined to people of color. Like everybody has this. Every single caption on a photograph is like, such and such are naturally strong, but lazy, you know, it's just like, and so it's a great visual hey. reference, but you're, it's, it's also, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. this is rough, rough stuff. Um, you have to know how to filter it out. Uh, yeah. So it's like a lot of it is you will straight up ignore the writing <laughs> and yeah. focus on, on what actual descriptions they have. It's like the moment mm -hmm. someone starts having an opinion, I'm like, whoa there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, that's been the tricky part with Squire, but what's really interesting is that a lot of the, the history I'm pulling from uh, is still standing. So when I was yeah. putting together my pitch for Squire, I actually went to Jordan and Turkey as part of you know a family trip because uh, my family is based in Jordan. Uh, but also because I got to do a lot of like firsthand research. So I would visit, you know, old temples and churches and Roman ruins and, you know, see for myself. I'm like, 
huh, this this rock has this texture on it. It's like these tiles look like this. I could take pictures of like my my little cousins running around and actually see how things were to scale. Like so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I could oh. really and everyone everyone is taking selfies and group photos and I'm in the corner like photographing <laughs> a plant sticking out of a rock. I'm like this is excellent. <laughs> yep. Oh, I send every once in a while I had a, a uh uh do you know Irene Strahovski's work? I don't think I do. How do I spell um, it out so other people can great. see what uh, Let me... Irene... I'll, I'll bring it up on Twitter. Hang on. Mm -hmm. Well, I say I'll bring it up on Twitter. <laughs> well, where is it? Um... I'm gonna bring it up on Facebook because nobody uses their name on Twitter. Um, <laughs> Is she a comic artist? Uh, yeah, she's yeah. a she's a comic artist. Um, but she was living in. She's from uh, Taiwan and was back there. Not too. Oh, come on! Now it's not working at all. Um, it's all good. She, she did. Um, she's she's amazing. She's got the the sort of unfortunate uh, thing of, of her last few projects have all been coming on as the replacement artist on a book that is had a super popular artist immediately before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is her Twitter handle? I can't find her Twitter hand handle. We're all uh, talking about research. We can't find this oh, one yeah. person. Sorry. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, Irene Strachowski, um, she's great. She, she's done Avatar and Squirrel Girl and Gwenpool and a bunch of other stuff. Um, Wait, then I definitely uh, know her stuff. Then why is the okay. name not ringing a bell? That's very weird. Um, maybe. Does she? Oh, she, she, she might go by Irene. Um, mm hmm uh, if you just spell out the last name, I can find it. <laughs> uh, S T R Y C H T R Y C H A L S K I A L S. All right, and her first name is Irene. Uh huh. All right. Let's. Anyway, see. Uh, this is sort of a, a long and circumventious way of saying like I, I found out she was going to um, uh, the Formosa Strait. Is that right? Um. And I was like, can you please take a picture of what all the plants look like at ground level? And so mm -hmm. she sent just this, this huge folder, all these all these plants for me. Uh, and I was so grateful because I was doing a thing based in uh, sort of on the, the Chinese, uh, Taiwanese border. Um, and uh, yeah, but it, but and anytime I'm somewhere, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I've learned over, over time, um, Oh, thanks. Jackie just sent me a text. Thanks, Jackie. Um, uh, Rennie Draws, R-E-N-I-E-D-R-A. -E Someone dropped it in the yeah. chat. Perfect. Oh, okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, um, anyway, but yeah, but I, I've learned over time the things that are, that I will need from stuff. And one of the biggest ones that I can't find in reference photos, but that I need is uh, what trees look like when they reach the ground what plants look like when they reach the ground bottoms of buildings like it's real easy for me to forget what the bottoms of things look like and i do a lot of slightly from above shots where you see characters feet and that becomes really important um so i've started to get more meticulous about my reference photos when i'm out and not just shooting the grandeur stuff but also you know what do uh you know what do the stairs look like what do the these look like um you got to get the mundane boring stuff yeah yeah mm -hmm. and um, that you know, that adds a degree of verisimilitude to your drawings when you're when you're working on them so yeah my mom uh is in mecca and medina right now for hajj and she's like been sending me non-stop photos of like tiles and stuff and it's very cute because she's like is is this good for you is this what you need <laughs> should i get in closer and I'm like it's perfect. Thank you. Yeah. I'm like more crowd shots, more crowd shots. <laughs> now, when you're when you're dealing with um, costume stuff, I know your architecture is really is is rooted really heavily in uh, accuracy. What what about your costumes? Are you are you pulling from a particular time period um, for Squire? Are you looking at it 
For Squire, uh, I did a ton of research on, it was very hard because so, uh, if you look at Islamic history or like history of areas that, you know, the Islamic empires took over, which is most of Northeast and uh, sorry, not Northeast, more, most of North Africa and the yeah. Middle East. Uh, mm -hmm. So the depiction of people uh, was frowned upon in certain certain periods, not across the board. Uh, yeah. And a lot of the a lot of the material that I had to base off of were miniature paintings. So miniature paintings yeah. are, they flatten out the space. They don't have a ton of uh, focus on individual characters. It's usually very broad scenes. Let me see if I can pull up a quick example so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna actually just look up uh, Mughal miniature paintings. Now this is specific to South Asia, which I'm not necessarily referencing, but it gives you the idea. Yeah. So for example, you have here, if it pulls up. So you have stuff like this, where it's like you mm -hmm. have a whole scene of people. And a lot of times it's a lot of different stories happening in the same exact space. So you don't actually get to see like details and folds and textures and stuff because it mm -hmm. just wasn't the focus of what people were doing. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, I actually, so as much as I, I enjoy doing like, you know, Middle Eastern history, I hate doing patterns and I hate doing <laughs> like what you would normally consider. <laughs> no, I get it. I get it. That's I, I absolutely cannot think yeah. of anything more boring than doing very carefully, meticulously done, repeating tile work and the stuff you think of when you immediately think of like Middle Eastern artwork. So when it, it, this is very much a story <laughs> of my own style, it's not going to have those those intricate patterns and tiles because I'm just too bored and yeah. too lazy to do them. That is why it's not it's nothing besides that. And also a little bit inside of me knows that's exactly what people will expect. And so I don't yeah. want to do it even more. <laughs> I, I tend to when I'm when I'm dealing with pattern stuff, I almost always like my uh, so somebody just asked, is there any way to treat patterns? And my answer for that is yes. Uh, the person that I look at for that by and large is Guy Davis, because mm -hmm. he will just do little squirrely jiggles and suggest texture, suggest patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it, it's wonderful. And let me see, I'm, I'm betting. For me, I pulled up uh, a bride story, which was uh, a very well-known uh, very well known manga that took place kind of in a similar setting, like it's historical fiction. Uh, and what was great about it is that very richly detailed, very carefully referenced, uh, you know, fabrics and environments and all that. I could never do this. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely, for the life of me, I could not sit there and carefully do it. And I, I'm actually fairly critical of uh, a bride story. Uh, it's a very, how do I put this delicately? It's racist. I'm just going to say yeah, like I that. Just, well, <laughs> it's very Orientalist. And it, you yeah. see a lot of the same tropes where, very similar to how, how French painters did it, uh, they would go crazy on, on the details. And, the, and you can't deny their technical skill. But it's ultimately a story about a young girl who gets married off to an 11-year-old head of his tribe. And it's like everyone's fine with it for some reason. And she uh -huh. gets like sold into a marriage. So... Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I don't need that right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm pulling up a Guy Davis thing. Um, okay. To use as an example, because I think he's got like a, a kind of a South Asian temple thing going on around here. Mm -hmm. um, maybe. And all of the patterns are while you're doing that, someone's asking how do you sheet patterns. Uh, yeah. For me, I actually, for a lot of the textiles and the patterns that I'm using in Squire, I actually looked at um, I looked at embroidery. So I went so I went to Jordan and Turkey over the summer, and I bought a lot of uh, traditional clothing while I was there. So I actually scanned 
one of the abayas, one of the dresses that I bought over there, and I made the pattern for one of the squire costumes from it. I like went over it and then I saved that file at a really high resolution and I made it a repeatable pattern. So if you go into Photoshop and you kind of make a repeatable pattern for yourself, you can uh, warp that onto different surfaces so you're not individually drawing it every time. And I, I tend to, um, okay, I, I took a couple snapshots and I'm going to send them to you via Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, as examples here. Um, so like his collar is a good example. And then, whoops, let me hit the send button. And then these poles. Um, are I think a good example of uh, Guy Davis's sort of pattern pattern work. Um, Let where me close the window so people oh, don't, don't see all my Twitter DMs while I pull it up. <laughs> sorry about that. See all the uh, scandalous messages we send. Yeah. All the shit talking. <laughs> um, the the other thing with with pattern stuff, and I'll do this sometimes where. If you're doing something architecturally, uh, mm -hmm. a great guy. Actually, let me just grab the book and I'll show you guys. Um, yeah. All right. Let's see here. Where is it? It's real big. Um, ah, here so this is like a giant process edition of uh, Silas Corey, which is a Pierre Allery book. Um, and one of the things that he has in here is a whole lot of pattern work. Um, and I'll show you an example in finished form. Um, if I can find one here. My lighting is not great on this side. Um, you could also, um, after we're done here, if you want, like taking pictures of them and tweeting them out for people to find later. OK. That could also work later on. So like here might be, so here's an example. And I can assume that I find it. So. Um, like he'll have these carpets mm -hmm. that are like this. Is that focusing? Yeah. yeah um, I see that. And, and so it's all hand drawn, but so that's page twenty two. Let me find the inks here. So but when he's doing his pencils, um So I brought up the example that you sent me on Twitter. Okay. So well, this isn't this isn't the same page, but it'll give you an idea of stuff. So in his pencils, he will just drop a pattern in, mm -hmm. um, and then when he's doing his inking, he will draw over the top of it loosely. Oh, okay. Um, so that is sort of a if you're if you're dealing with um, architectural stuff. So like that's that's the pencil. It's more me... implying it. He's not doing the work, and also it doesn't make sense because then there's too much. It's too much stuff competing visually. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you get it right so you're not dropping lines down haphazardly and it still looks like it makes sense. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, you're, but you're using it as sort of a, a, the basis from which to do kind of loose mm -hmm. winging, which I think is yeah nice. Um, yeah, but I kind of, I, I like those kind of cheats. I, I have yet to find an arena where I usually need them. Um, uh, but generally speaking, like when I when I cheat a pattern, I am just doing doodly. So like mm -hmm. this this Rosemary Sutcliffe here. Um, let's see if I can get it to focus. Mm, it's not going to focus. Um, Do you have it in one of the examples you sent over? I don't think so. But a lot of them sort of have this um, this same. If you if you go to my 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 patreon or something to look through like basically anybody with a pattern that it that you know i'm i'm faking that pattern i'm doing squiggles and it kind of looks like a pattern mm -hmm. and if i'm wanting to do something that kind of has that sort of more geometric pattern type of thing i'm still going to do squiggles i'm just gonna block them into basic shapes and then do squiggles inside um and those squiggles seem to suggest a pattern that's enough for me to be happy with Oh, the ones that I said. Yeah, yeah. So, like, uh, so, so this this guy Davis one is a real good example. I'm going to bring this up a little bit bigger so that I can look at it. So, if you look at the uh, the those pillars, 
he's got some basic shapes in there. So he's done some snake patterns because um, the guy who's doing this is this uh, uh, talk, talking about like Orientalism plays real heavy into this. Like mm-hmm. he's basically this this British guy who was real into Orientalism in the eighteen fifties, and he's now one hundred and fifty years old, and so all of his stuff kind of has this anyway uh, th- this type of thing. So you can see kind of these teeth and this uh, this swirly thing so he'll do these basic shapes that suggest an a pattern pattern so mm-hmm. you have the squirrels you have the, those jagged lines but then inside it's just little doohickeys he's just throwing some uh some quick mark making in there and as a result he can be really fast and he can get this across but you still have that sense of a a very clear and deliberate pattern mm-hmm. that is just uh, suggested, and I I really like kind of working in that in that realm. And that's there, there's two things that I kind of outright steal from Davis in terms of approach. And one is that, and the other is the the way that he draws buildings. Um, mm-hmm. He is not precious about not just showing the perspective grids. And so when he draws, say, a line of windows in a skyscraper, you'll see the line on top and bottom to which the windows attach. Like there's no going in and whiting out that part yeah. between the windows. And it's just so much faster. It doesn't look any worse. And mm-hmm. I, I I, find myself doing that a lot too. So, but those, so but, much of it is like the average audience member is, the average reader, I suppose, uh, isn't gonna be looking at the panel long enough to notice. And mm-hmm. you already have to have an informed eye to know like, you didn't go in and erase that mark. I see what yeah. you did there. And, and even then, as someone with, kind of an informed view you still go ahead and appreciate it so he's like winning on every single part of it yeah yeah yeah. oh he's he's the best he is probably my favorite working artist um and he doesn't he doesn't do comics anymore now he's he's pretty much just doing um uh designs for Guillermo del Toro movies but he's 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 so good and he's got such a substantial body of work that you can go through um uh we we got a question about um the size of the final product when it comes to print. My my solution of that, uh, we talked about that a little bit before, but um, my solution for that is that I use the same line weight pin for everything, um, which is a pit uh, a Faber-Castell size F pit pin. Mm-hmm. And then the pencil tool that I use on the computer uh, mimics that, uh, mm-hmm. which is a size 15 round hard pencil brush uh, set at about uh, with a minimum diameter of 60. So it has about the same amount of uh, weight variation that a pit pin will have, um, which is very little, but enough to make it kind of springy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those are the only two line tools that I use for pretty much anything. Like I'll, I'll, I'll hash in chunks of black with something else. But if you look at stuff, it might not seem it, but um, but everything I do is is fixed line or real close to fixed line. And that's because in working for colors, um, I, I can only process so many things. So when I was doing black and white, I used varying line weights to suggest depth. But now I suggest that in color. And when I try to compound those two, it just gets too clunky. And so it's easier to just omit that as a factor to contend with. Uh, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, for me, I had to resist the urge to zoom in. So it wasn't just about holding myself back as an illustrator to be like, you know, it makes no sense both time-wise or for the po- final product for me to get into the nitty-gritty detail. It's just not going to show up when it goes to print. And also, another way I had to, I had to learn it the hard way when I was in art school, where I had one teacher who I was very frustrated with him. I, he's old school in the sense where he's like, you have to pass in everything as a print. I don't care if you only work digitally. I want a physical copy on my wall when you guys come into class. So mm-hmm. I had to learn really quickly that what I was doing digitally anyways was wouldn't yours. necessarily mm-hmm. work for print. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I I got in the habit of when I do thumbnails or when I do sketches and I'm starting to play around with the values and stuff, I would just go and print it on a smaller size. So if it doesn't read at at like four inches high when I'm doing like a test print just on my home computer, it's not gonna read at, you know, at eight inches by by five inches. So it's like doing, just making sure you're constantly going back to check throughout 
throughout each step of the process. Yeah. And and that that switch from one to the other is always is always going to be a little bit tricky. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to everything I do tends to print darker than I'm expecting it to. Mm -hmm. um, like they, I, I just saw the the uh, the uh, I I did some art for a board game recently, and I the I got copies of it, and the box art is so much darker than I expected it to be, mm -hmm. um, and it looks fine, but it's it it's not what I would have picked. Um, mm -hmm. Because I tend to want the line work to do most of the heavy lifting, and the I, I I don't put a lot of emphasis on value for compositional purposes. Mm -hmm. um, like the 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 black and white is where I, I put most of my in, in, uh, energies, mm -hmm. um, and so but but most of the time I tend to color the way that I think it looks good digitally, and then I go in and uh, the colors the non line weight stuff. I lighten by a considerable margin before sending it to print, and it still usually looks fine. Um, and it doesn't look as good digitally; it looks a little washed out, but it prints the way I want it to. So, mm -hmm. um, so I've got kind of a rubric that I use that that works pretty well for that. And I think you always have to have two types of files on hand. You have to have the stuff you're going to share to social media, and you're going to have the stuff that you're going to send to the printer. Uh, yeah. And just like remembering to stay organized during that process is probably yeah. nice for you. Uh, one thing I also did as kind of a cheat uh, when I was first figuring out um, the kind of dimensions I wanted to work in for Squire is I just scanned in uh, a page of a comic. I scanned in um, This One Summer by Jillian and Mariko Tamaki because I absolutely love that book. And to me, that was the perfect size of a young adult novel. And I wanted uh, on the very like tactile kind of surface, very superficial way, I wanted Squire to feel like that book in my hands. Yeah. So I scanned in a page like that and I looked at uh, how much space she left in the gutters, how much, um, wh what was the like, the line weight for the panels and things like that. And I just lifted it from there. And that kind of that, informed That's a some great of the, way to do it. That's yeah. an absolutely great way to do it. So it's like, uh, I didn't have to, to experiment around. I saw what worked and I applied it to what I wanted to do too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Do we want to, uh, are you at the point where we want to open it up for questions or? Uh, uh, yeah, let's do like a, a lightning round. Because now okay. we're hitting sort of like 10 o'clock on my end. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's late. Um, <laughs> it's fine. It's just I do have one last page of work to finish up. Oh, no. It's, I didn't okay. have um, good uh, scheduling. <laughs> today. Well, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to do it. Uh, Artie, thank you for your uh, your USB drive for the, the printing, that's always helpful. Um, what is Trogdor? Oh, Trogdor is the board game that I did. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so that was the, that uh, reference there. Uh, Furzog, thank you for buying Krogan Adventures. I hope you enjoy it. Um, it's uh, quite a bit older at this point. I think that one's about 10 years old, so my, my aesthetic has changed quite a bit since then. Those were... Uh, I kind of came right out of the gate doing, uh, doing doing comics. Like, I was real lucky to have a have a, a book published within my first year of, mm -hmm. uh, of coming out, and so you definitely see the the uh, growth or change or development or however you want to look at it you know some people don't look at it as growth they you know because they like this aesthetic better than that aesthetic um but you you definitely see the the shift over time um uh between my my earlier stuff and my current stuff which is going to be more pronounced than what you'll see between my current stuff and what you'll see a few years down the road but you know even things from like three years ago look a lot different uh than what i'm doing now so there, there's constant changing and shifting someone's asking what your best comic is um okay uh, my best comic i would say is the the best art is the book i did with my my closest friend kyle starks we did mars attacks last year uh and i'm real happy with how that turned out and we're going to be doing another project together soon i hope um uh but my best my best holy me book is a kid's spooky mystery story uh called the creeps and it's the second book in the series um 
Uh, so there were three in that series that came out. And the second one is called The Trolls Will Feast. Uh, and it is uh, basically these these trolls emerge every however many years to try and stress out uh, the town with gossip and whatever else because when people have marinated in their stress hormones, uh, it, long and complicated, they're fighting these trolls. Uh, and... Uh, I'm really, I'm really happy with how that one turned out. It's the first one that I didn't tightly outline. Um, everything else I outlined pretty tightly. And then since then, yeah, that's the one. Um, and, uh, since that time, um, I don't as much. And with this one, I sort of had a very vague idea and I was like, well, it has to be 116 pages, but I, or 120 pages, but I can, I'm just going to wing it and hope I land on 120 pages. And that I did. That is brave. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I had a general idea for, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I can gauge like where I am in a given story at a given point, know how much time I still have and that kind of stuff. That's a very um, valuable skill set as a comic artist. Yeah, I don't fingers. know if I have it. <laughs> well, it's kind of like, I mean, it's kind of like telling a story, you know, if you're, on a subway and you know you have x amount of time to finish the story you can kind of pace according to that it it you know it's an acquired skill it takes some time but um uh but with the uh anyway so i i barely plotted it out i was like you got monsters they're gonna do this um and as a result the characters dictated the flow of the plot in a way that i'd never done before like i i usually have an idea for a the genre or era or whatever it is and i build a cast of characters and i say okay these are the six characters that i'm going to put in this story um treating it almost like i'm shooting a film and i have these six actors to work with and so who's going to play which part um you're a very so character focused illustrator i feel like and storyteller it's like you you know who you want driving driving things along hey matt um and so, yeah, so that's a, uh, so, so, so that's a factor, but usually I'll outline things because I'm so worried about space and changing things later and stuff like that. And as I ideally become a more competent storyteller, I become less worried about screwing things up and knowing that I can set things up and pay them off. And so now what I do is I tend to just start on page one and go until I'm done. And I'm much happier with the outcomes of that because I'll find that the characters behave in ways that I wasn't expecting and turn the story in certain directions. And anyway, so the Trolls Will Feast, I feel like is a much more emotionally rich story than my other ones, which is kind of silly because it's about a bunch of kids fighting <laughs> trolls. I was about to say, the Trolls Will Feast is your most emotionally <laughs> intellectual piece. Yeah. So, <laughs> it, um, so that one, I also, yeah, I think, I think that's hands down my strongest one. I mean, I'm, 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 proud of everything there's there's definitely flaws in them and there are definitely things that i would shift uh according to um you know my my current artistic priorities my current uh ethics my current ideas as to what is important to be covering in a story mm -hmm. but i still feel like they're all good reads and that's that's my hope um mm -hmm. so we got one about how do you thoughts on turning historical references into fantasy or sci-fi settings without twisting the original source too much, staying respectful of the reality? Can, I, I feel like that's kind of what what we've been talking about. Well, yeah, I think I think yeah. probably the concern there, the the staying respectful to reality aspect, is at what point does it do a disservice to the period that you're that you're covering? Now, with yours, I. I I think this is a slightly different kettle of fish where you're concerned because you are using your own heritage and your own background to inform the aesthetics and ideas behind your thing. Whereas a lot of fantasy authors and science fiction authors are sort of taking from other cultures and sort of further orientalizing them into a way that uh, can be somewhat problematic and sort of detaches itself from the original source material. So, um, I think what well, part of it is is that so for me, I, I identify Squire as as fantasy 
comfortably uh, because even though it is, like I mentioned before, historical fan fiction more than anything, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not really looking at specific um, specific historical events. I'm not necessarily looking at at you know uh, a war that's happened or an exodus or you know I can't point to any anything in history and be like this is what I based it off of. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm very consciously using uh, language. I'm using character design. I'm using settings. I want it to be very clearly identifiable as uh, you know different places in the Middle East. Like certain characters yeah. will have uh, ethnic traits where it's like oh this person's clearly influenced by Sudan this person has the same like Palestinian embroidery in their clothing it feels informed you can see where where the the research was done I want that to to be clear uh, but at the same time you know I'm not when, when in the story it's very much about like a young girl joins the army it's about colonial rule there's not no such thing as like a good empire it's critiquing a lot of that so the themes in the story are actually pulled from a more contemporary space. I pull a lot from my own experience as an Arab American than I do uh, as someone with Arab heritage. Because uh, yeah. this is going to sound weird. It's like I, I don't feel like that just because I'm Arab, I suddenly have more right to those stories. You know, I have a family and friends and cousins who have grown up their whole lives in the Middle East. and they are very particular about how their culture and their history is represented. And I actually would be just as much of a voyeur to their stories as, you know, a person who, who grew up in the Arab diaspora, uh, as I would for, you know, uh, another, another American writer. So and I think of my position and my, my responsibility to that in a very informed way. So I try to talk about the stuff that, I know I can talk about, and I try to to let the people who are from those actual um, areas who know their history better than I do uh, to. I, I, it's my role to uplift them to speak up. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily my job to do it for them. Uh, and there's some interesting conversations. Not to go on too much of a tangent. There's some interesting conversations happening uh, right now among uh, writers of immigrant backgrounds like me of the the responsibility of authenticity it's mm -hmm. a very tricky topic where it's like you have chinese writers speaking up and mm -hmm. talking about the fact that it's like they can't speak chinese they didn't grow up in china they weren't taught that history so why are they confined to only talking about that that kind of story and when they do um historical fiction or when they do fantasy that's inspired by their culture uh they they want people to understand it's like it's still it's still fantasy at the end of the day. It's, they're not tied to those expectations. And just because they come from that background doesn't mean that's all they have to offer. So that's a very long way of, of getting to that point. Yeah. yeah. And I also think it's, there's a conversation to be had of like when you have an option to represent people of color or people of marginalized backgrounds or you know, marginalized identities, do you have to import the same prejudices that we have? Like, you'll have fantasy stories where there's still rampant um, homophobia, and you're like, why do we need that? Either we can yep. accept dragons, but we can't accept this. Like, why do we need to, to export that? You have in Lord of the Rings, like, you know, the, the trolls and the orcs and all that were, were very clearly references to, uh, you know, African people. It's like, do we need to have that in our fantasy? No. Is it accurate? Some could argue yes. But is it what we need? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And that's that's sort of where I think history, or and that that's the element of fantasy that's the most appealing to me is being able to present a world in which mm -hmm. the things that you don't necessarily want to cover that are endemic to this particular era otherwise can be excised for the sake of narrative, especially if you're writing for a younger audience. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I. Yeah, I, I, I'm ill suited to answer that one because I don't do fantasy or sci-fi really. Um, I, I do think that there, you know, there's a degree of simplification anytime you're you're dealing with a, a period, um, uh, and, and you know, there's a degree of curation. Like I, 
I tend to love focusing whatever the region, whatever the uh, uh, whatever the the time period. I tend to want to focus on the stuff that, well, two twofold, and uh, this is the the part of his historical fiction that I think grabs me the most is you want to highlight one of two elements at any given point um, uh, in order for it to to really be engaging. Um, the first is the universality of the human condition. You know, and this is especially easy to see when you find quotes about, you know, I spike today on uh, on Twitter, you know, there, there there's talk about, you know, video games causing violence and whatever else. She posted a list of all the things that are supposed to ruin children uh, throughout history, you know, like, like the waltz and uh, novel reading and stuff like that. There will always be something. Yeah, and that that's sort of falling to that universality of human condition. People who are dealing with this stuff. There's a wonderful book, um, which this one, not a ton of people have read it, and it's such a shame because it is, I think, one of the, one of, if not the best, not, not counting Usagi. Usagi's the best. This is, I would say, the second best. Getting ready to uh, jot it down. <laughs> yeah, historical, um, uh, historical adventure graphic novel uh mm -hmm. and it is templar uh it's um uh where's the page i want to get people's first names right um it's uh jordan mechner who did um uh prince of persia back in the day he wrote it um and then um the uh, the husband and wife team of uh uh Liu and fam and alex Pivillard. uh fam has done more books just herself since then i think but um but it is it's basically oceans 11 but in 12 15 um oh, so cool and it's so well done and it's so good but my favorite thing in this and this is sort of that universality of human condition is as part of the uh as part of the caper they they go in and they they're they are ostensibly workers and they're they're starting something out and then they leave to do another part of the caper and the guy who's in charge of the citadel or whatever is like these these you know these masons and stuff they come in with a big crew and they make a big show of starting and then they leave for like two weeks and get no work done and i'm like and i love this just sort of the, the corollary between modern contractors and these 13th century building guys and it's just it, it makes it feel so real and it makes it feel like an experience that we're all dealing with, you know, and I, and so that's a great example of that universality of human condition uh, that you see echoed throughout the ages. And so highlighting things that we, um, you need the little we, moments. Yeah. Those little moments and the things that we deal with that you see over and over. And I think that's wonderful. And so anytime you can find, uh, and that's also why you see time periods have specific resurgences. So like, you know, you get a lot of, uh, like, we got quite a bit of 1920s stuff not mm -hmm. too long ago because our aesthetic was very keen on 1920s. And because, you know, we're sort of sliding into, you know, a strong, strong man political theater and stuff like that. And so mm -hmm. all of it feels like a very easy corollary to pull in. You know, in the 80s, we were dealing with 50s stuff because we were dealing with a lot of 50s stuff in the 80s. You know, and so there's there's things like, you know, in the... the and we, we, we echo our own time periods when we're doing history. And the easiest place to see this is the Western. You know, like, if you look at Western movies, Western movies are just contemporary movies and cowboy hats, you know? Western it's like what you mentioned before. No one actually wants the, the first-hand edition stuff. Like, yeah. We don't need it right now. Yeah. It's, you don't actually want to talk with the same syntax and the same language as people from that time period. You have to, you have to still, you're still talking to the readers of right now at the yeah. end of the day. So yeah. you need to make sure that you're, you're speaking to them first through all these characters and scenarios and through your history. Yeah. We wouldn't look at history if we didn't think we were learning anything from it, hopefully, oh. ideally. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that so that that's the one side. The other side is the stuff that is so nutty that it it's so out of place. It feels like you're on a tourist adventure. Kind yeah, of. Um, and, and that's so, super fun too. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, so Mad Men's a good example. And there's a mm -hmm. few examples of this early on. Like, you know, the 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 mom 
rooms are in the kitchen and they're they're smoking one of them's pregnant and the little girl comes in and she's got a dry cleaning bag over her face and she's breathing it into her mouth back and forth um and the mom looks at her and she's like you know daughter's name uh and the kid stops and she's like the dress that was in there better not be on the floor and the kid like walks out like breathing in her <laughs> bag and it's such a departure from what we expect because we're used to oh dry cleaning bags are dangerous yeah. for kids to be breathing in and out etc um that it that it it sort of shocks us into the realization that we're in a different place in time yeah. um and so this going to what you're talking about with the the thing like this it's this is where the danger of sort of fetishizing a culture or time period comes in mm -hmm. is because the stuff that's weird and the stuff that's different by our state by our contemporary american you know 2019 standards uh you want to highlight that but mm -hmm. but in highlighting that are you cartoonizing this culture and so finding that balance mm -hmm. is tricky and i you know where i i live in the southeast i'm in you know tennessee and kentucky pretty free i live in kentucky i'm in tennessee a lot and i'm in the carolina mountains quite a bit um and that's that's pretty much my uh my milieu uh and so i i, I don't venture beyond there too too frequently um but the stuff that i like in this region tends to be sort of the the more run you know just aesthetically the 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 more rural the more kind of rundown type mm -hmm. of stuff because that's where i feel comfortable and so i kind of look for those corollaries in every culture and that tends to be where you kind of get into folk dress uh oh i saw i was up at a museum recently and they had a, an, an interesting exhibit that was like fashion design and it talked about the difference in how how the difference in terminology plays into this so much mm -hmm. um so when you had stuff that was urban and this is from like fashion design in the 1700s all these things that would come out these publications um when you had stuff that was urban it was called fashion and when you had stuff that was rural uh or non-western it was called costume and so it would be like it would be you know like basically you know farmer clothes were costume city clothes mm -hmm. were fashion um and you know uh it, parisian clothes belgian clothes are fashion uh moroccan clothes are costume and so 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 you you had this kind of dichotomy and the stuff but by and large i am only interested in what those 17th century folks would have called costume and so mm -hmm. um because and you know you, you have to use their language in order to find what they were saying about it at yeah. those times yeah it ties back to that where it's like you you have to it's very interesting um i feel like even within this is this might get me in a little bit of trouble but uh, in online spaces there is an obsession to quickly denounce and almost wipe wipe away any proof of of problematic material if we're going to use that term uh, but the reality of the matter is just because you, you've moved on past from, from certain language, from certain terminology, you have to still understand that preserving how people actually talked is still important. And you can't quite learn from, from, you can't quite move past that language unless you understand why people spoke that way to begin with. Yeah. Uh, no, that, that's mm -hmm. absolutely true. And it's, it's true. You know, I mean, a lot of the early, you know, if you look at sort of like uh, African American dialect studies in the like the 1860s, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the problem with them is not so much that they exist. The problem is that they were used to inform minstrel portrayals. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, so it's, it's less the content in and of itself and more the baggage that it's accumulated over misuse of years. Um, so it's like we still have to know how to interact with that material. We have to give people the tools and the vocabulary to recognize it for what it is, recognize the purpose it served uh, in context, 
and then be able to step away from it and know their responsibility as creators, as storytellers, to then decide what you want to bring with you and what you need to keep behind you. Uh, yeah. Especially when it comes when it comes to terms of accuracy, you you remember as a storyteller and a creator, as we mentioned before, it's like what what who are we talking to? Who is your audience? What is your goal? Uh, and sometimes being a purist about accuracy or, or feigning, you know, uh, feigning that role, because a lot of people like to pretend that's that's what they really care about. Uh, people people like to conveniently act as if the language will no longer have uh, any effects or any harms. So it's like if we're importing it wholesale without any critique, without any discussion, uh, ultimately that's what's going to happen. You you still have people teaching. Uh, Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer in schools and you know at the end of the day it is still an American classic but at the same time it's like you're going to have students in those classrooms who are going to be affected by the language that's used in those books so mm -hmm. when I was taught it in high school we had we had the the derogatory terminology blocked out so it's like you knew where it was there you wouldn't have to read it out loud you wouldn't have to um you know, there's still a reaction to even just seeing the word in that classroom. And mm -hmm. we always had to have a, do a discussion of like, why we're still reading this, why it's still in the curriculum. Uh, and honestly, when I left high school, they actually had a student led discussion about removing it from the curriculum entirely. So it mm -hmm. was the students themselves who had to step up and be like, we understand, but there's more that we can learn. And the same kind of, they had a very, comprehensive sort of argument that I thought was fantastic from the AP English students where they, they presented to the head of the curriculum, uh, the, the head of the English department, and they said like, here are our alternatives. We know why you're teaching us this book. We you know appreciate the time we took with it. We don't want other students having to go through that same process. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I thought it was like really, amazing how it was the students themselves like stepping up to the plate and taking that initiative yeah and you know canon is shifting all the time and mm -hmm. what you know and there's you know you you do have to sort of balance out what your you know what you're getting from something versus mm -hmm. what it's taking from you yeah um and I think that it's, you know, I think, I think those sorts of, ah, excuse me, those sorts of discussions are incredibly important to have. And I think it's wonderful that the, the students are, are leading it. It's on the, on the side of the, on the creation side of things, it's, you know, I, I am not in a position, like, It's it's hard because so so let's say you're dealing with something like you know the the nearer to can one of the reasons why I think a lot of people like dealing with ancient stuff medieval stuff is that you can essentially askew a lot of the um, the elements that people would be taking issue with today like when you're within about when you're dealing with american history mm -hmm. and you're dealing with um well any any aspect of it any part of american history you are dealing with stuff that is still affecting people's lives today mm -hmm. and i mean yeah you, you're you know you're dealing with you know middle age you know you're still dealing with french invasion or whatever in 1066 yeah there's there's stuff, but but mm -hmm. in in our country, you can do anything outside of our country without it necessarily, or, or anything uh, preceding our country without it being stuff that immediately affects our lives and the lives of readers and things like that. Like once you get into our. Uh, sort of our history, our national mythology, anything along those lines. And you have people who have stakes on every conceivable side. You have mm -hmm. folks who are, you know, buying into the mythological elements of it and it's a real source of personal identity. You have folks who are suffering under the consequences of this or that, you know, and so um, approaching these stories is 
an incredibly tricky proposition. Um, and from the revolution onwards, the, the closer you get in time, the more tricky those propositions are. Um, to to uh, Anyway, that's... I don't really know where it I was gets going. Stickier. <laughs> yeah, it gets stickier. Yeah, um, stickier. And so I think that when you're dealing with ancient world stuff, when you're dealing with medieval stuff... It's just displaced enough where yeah. there's a bit more room to... I, I think, honestly... A bit more room to get things wrong. Yeah, and, and you, well, we'll be you okay. Can, you can deal with those those problematic elements of history, or excise them entirely, whichever mm -hmm. one you want to do, um, without it being a slap in the face of the people who are dealing with that yeah. now. You know, you can say, "Oh, well, you know what? Uh, you know, being forced into a nunnery sure is lousy." Chances are you don't know anybody who's been forced into a nunnery, or, or anyone's or, grandma who was <laughs> or anyone's grandma who was forced into a nunnery. Yeah. Whereas, if you talk about how great this era was, or you talk about how terrible this era was, or whatever else, somebody's, you know, again dealing with the consequences of that if it's within the past two hundred years, and so it it yeah, I tend to like. Um, I I'm really fascinated by sort of the the first half of the 19th century in American history because mm -hmm. we tend to touch it so little in school we tend to not dramatize it very much mm -hmm. like it's hard to think of you know more than 10 movies that are set between I mean I I, I can think of them because I've actively sought them sought them out and collected the average them. person has no idea but, but yeah like 10 movies set between like 1800 and 1850 in america like it's real hard to find them mm -hmm. um uh but there's so much weird and interesting stuff that's happening in that period but that weird and interesting stuff is directly related to stuff that we're dealing with now mm -hmm. um and so any way that you approach it it's still going to you're still going to have to take a stance on issues or by not taking a stance you're taking a stance so it's um yeah this uh, may be I, a whole can of worms but i do want to bring it up even if it's just for a minute it's a room it on that note of you know this era of history is, is far enough away that we feel safer setting stories in it because it feels a bit more detached it becomes almost fantasy in itself yeah, um, yeah. you you see within uh, the narrative of white supremacist group, they've tried to take Viking and Nordic history as this mm -hmm. imaginary, pure Aryan, it's complete and utter bullshit. Let's establish that mm -hmm. first and foremost. There's absolutely no, um, there, there's nothing concrete to, to the kind of stories they tell. And it's very weird. Yeah. It's like they use the show Vikings for a lot of their imagery too. Uh, if you look at some of the, you know, the posts that that are on those online communities. So it's completely fabricated, but it's a very real story because that's ultimately what they're just selling to folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and you'll see, I follow quite a few um, medieval historians and, and historians who actually focus on those era. And they've gone from, from being people who thought they were just studying archives and just studying, you know, symbols and caves and stuff into real time, uh, real time experts to, to like actual national identity. Yeah. And it's been very jarring to see, to see that happen in real time. Um, and it's very weird. It's like historians don't realize that they have to be equipped for those conversations because yeah. Because now, as people are looking to history, they're revisiting it in very dangerous ways, and they're revising it in very dangerous ways. So, yeah, it's, it's there is a real weight to getting it wrong. Yeah, yeah, you got to be careful. Um, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Matt asked, could you toss out some of those 1800s to 1850s films? Um, yeah, some some examples. Uh, uh, the Revenant with the the Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, other Mountain Men movies. So um, Jeremiah Johnson, Man in the Wilderness, uh, The Mountain Men. Um, How many mountains are there? There, there's a there's a handful of mountains. There's one with Oliver <laughs> Reed, and he's it's it's real it's a real creeper movie. He, like he he buys a wife. What? 
I can't remember what it's called. Um, These are all on- heavy oh, movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's made like a like a rom com kind of. <laughs> but, you know, it is it, it is what it is. Um, uh, gosh, what else? There's uh, Seminole War stuff. Um, let's see, what are the Seminole War ones? Um, uh, Wind across the Everglades. Uh, Seminole Seminole Wars are sort of 1815 through like 1840 ish. Um, Distant Drum, Seminole, uh, One Man's Hero is the only Mexican war movie I can think of, maybe, which is uh, Tom Berenger as part of the, a Catholic brigade that defected to the Mexican army during the Mexican war. Um, and then the, the Alamo, the 2004 Alamo with Billy Bob Thornton is one of my very favorite historical movies. I love that movie so much. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it's just great. If you haven't seen that, Disney's Alamo. Oh, two big old thumbs up from me. Um, those are that. That's kind of it that I can think of. Like every, anything else that kind of touches on that period or biopics that might have some stuff in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there aren't there aren't very many. Um, uh, somebody asked, "Do you think it's possible to reach a point where you stop teaching visually about historic figures and myths and start to become patronizing toward your reading audience? You don't know about X. Were you living under a rock?" I don't feel like that's in my no. nature to do that. Um, I there have been times where I've been snobby about stuff in the past, and it tends to be where any any time I behave badly, it comes from a place of insecurity. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are those same cases where I feel like I should know about something, and I don't know as much as I do. And so the best thing for me to do is sort of to tear other people down about it. Those, those instances are very infrequent. Like when, you know, the, the times where I've been uh, a real stinker, you know, I can, I, I mean, I'm sure I've rubbed people the wrong way, but I, I you know, I think about them a lot. You know, there, there's probably 10 of them in the past 10 years and I feel bad about all of them and they inform my future decision making. Um, the, the scenes you see at 1 a.m. when you just get into bed and you're like, oh no, I said something stupid in that one yeah. conversation. Yeah. <laughs> most, most of them, I think like two are were things I said online that I, you know, I think hurt people's feelings. Um, oh, I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen the Donner Party. Well, Jot that one down as well. Oh. Donner party. I will. I will track it down. Um, yeah, there's a few sort of travel west things. There's a there's there's a couple things about sort of uh, uh, like the Mormon Western trek. I haven't seen. Um, there's 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 a handful. That there there's some San Francisco movies. You know that are, are you like saying it's not very good. <laughs> 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 okay, I'll cross it off. <laughs> yeah. Um, I missed that part. <laughs> I forget. Oh, but in, anyway, I the the uh, the the patronizing thing. I I try not to be like my my assumption is that just like me, there are so many arenas where I am woefully underinformed about mm-hmm. what other people know. Like uh, you know, an easy one is pop music. Like I don't know anything from like the seventies or eighties. Um, oh, I was and, thinking something more contemporary. Or anything more, or or anything post like two thousand and two. Like. <laughs> basically the you know stuff that was on the oldie station when i was a kid uh to you know some so so 50s to mid 60s and then uh the stuff that was on when i was in middle school and high school and that is it for my knowledge of pop music you cleared uh, out all that space so you could have more historical facts yeah <laughs> but, you, know, you know like uh, movies you know t- uh different hi- parts of history that i don't know about books Comics, like there's so uh, there's, I know so little about mainstream comic artists. I have to say, it is a joy to be the dumbest person in the room. <laughs> you get to learn stuff. It really yeah. is. A like, and then no, it's I only agree. you. There's only yeah. going up from there. Like, what are you gonna lose? And I think yeah. you have to find joy in admitting you have no idea what the topic yeah. is about. I find, you know, real joy in in sitting down and listening to people talk uh, about stuff they're passionate about. Honestly, the one thing that I worry about is that I'm not very good at realizing when 
the person I'm talking to doesn't care about the same thing as me. Yeah. So they'll be like, oh, what's that about to be like polite? And I'd be like, boy, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> and then well, spend and that, 15 and, minutes. Yeah. And the, the, the biggest issue with me is sort of trying to find the balance between keeping something engaging for a person who is already intimately familiar with the subject that I'm presenting mm -hmm. uh, and making it accessible enough that someone who's never heard of it isn't going to feel like they are, you know, out of touch or out mm -hmm. of step or have been living under a rock. And the best way for me to do this is to present it really basically, but always do my best to present a bit of information that I've never seen mm -hmm. written in secondary media before um either whether that is an interpretation that i'm bringing to the table you know i do a lot of like text analysis when i'm writing stuff or you know putting something in a contextual frame or things along those lines i feel like that's part of what i'm bringing to the table um you know sometimes like in the pirate case like i'm i'm talking about things that i haven't seen in books that i'm finding in primary sources so so that's kind of how i balance it out i present it as elementary and then add something for the experts also me and chris are nerding out about nonfiction stories and comics it's not necessarily anything anyone knows about <laughs> except yeah. for the 20 people in this live stream mm -hmm. <laughs> or cares about it's like there's not a lot of room to gloat here yeah <laughs> we're aware of what we're doing <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And I think, and yeah, so I, I, if you ever see me acting like that, please call me out on it. Um, I, I learn best when I'm shamed. Mm -hmm. Um, so not in the sense of like public shamey type stuff, but in the sense where if I'm, if I'm saying or doing something that is hurtful to somebody, you know, ideally, uh, I know it's hard to reach out to somebody and tell them that, but ideally, when in the situations where folks have, it has changed the way that I behave going forward. And so my, my hope is that that'll continue to be the case. But ideally, nobody will have to do that because I won't, hopefully I won't be patronizing to anybody. It's all good. I think, is that all the questions somebody asked if I like Magnolia stuff? I didn't when I started out. Um, or at least let, let me rephrase. I loved his art. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really like his storytelling because, and it, I now like it for the same reason that I didn't used to like it, which is that he, he does the exact opposite of what I would do in a given situation, mm -hmm. narratively, like in terms of where he's cutting, what he's focusing on. It's mostly pacing stuff. And it was real off-putting to me. And now I find it so... Um, exciting because you know most of the time i'm reading stuff it's like watching a you know a disney movie or something you know where it's going to go and you can yeah. appreciate the artistry of it with magnola i never know where it's going to go like i never not just in, not not in terms of the the content but also not in terms of the execution like the execution is 100 percent a surprise with mm -hmm. every single panel and i really dig that a lot i have yet to sit down and read hellboy mm-hmm I've seen so much of his art around. I love his art, you know, and his inking style and all that. But I just, I've committed a little bit of a nerd crime. <laughs> no, all, all my, my, so my, my best friend Kyle, who I mentioned, he gets so mad. Every time we have a car trip, he'll mention a comic. And it's the same ones. It's all the, <laughs> the ones that were real big in the 90s. Like, I never read any Vertigo stuff. I was, I was uh, slightly too young for picking it up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and had no avenue through which to pick it up. So things like Preacher or Sandman or yeah. things like that. Like I've never read any Garth Ennis and I've never read any... Uh, I saw uh, Sandman eight. when I was, you know, in middle school and stuff. And for me, my only reaction, because, you know, I don't have any nostalgia to this. I don't know who Neil Gaiman is. I look mm -hmm. at it, I'm like, not into the art. Close it, put it down, pick up a Calvin mm -hmm. and Hobbes. Like that's, yeah. that's what I'm going to do at that age. I didn't grow up with... Um, like a, a good 
comic book store, so to speak. I actually straight yeah. up wasn't allowed to go to my local comic book store. Like my older brother would have to take me there because it was a little bit of a creeper spot, if we're going to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but I had a, a great, great library where we had like manga, we had comics, we had every like a great young adult section. And if you wanted anything at all, the librarians would automatically go and order it. So I was very lucky in that respect. You're of a you're of a generation that's that's fascinating to me. And, you know, and I had I it, it's I'm not unused to it. You know, my students were in the, the same the same boat. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the institutional access that uh, everybody had with things like you know libraries, borders, things like that, carrying mm -hmm. stuff like the thing that got that kind of got me reading comics and drawing comics again, that, and then got me looking for stuff online, which stumbled me across the Go Comic stuff that I mentioned, mm -hmm. was that all of a sudden. Uh, Barnes and Noble and Borders and uh, had graphic novel sections that were more than Star Wars collections and RPG manuals. Like mm -hmm. for a long time, that was it. It was like you could get Dark Knight Returns of Batman Year One. You could get some X Men trades, mm -hmm. maybe uh, some Star Wars trades, maybe and RPG books. And that was that was it. There wasn't manga. There weren't. Um, you could find comic strip collections in the humor section, mm -hmm. uh, or the public library at seven forty one point something. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I was in that section a bunch. Um, and uh, and um, and that was that was kind of your your thing. We had stuff around the house, and that was huge. Like I had mm -hmm. a uh, well, got it here. Um, at this book when I was a kid, which is um, Bern Hogarth did this. Adaptation yes. of the first half of Tarzan of the Apes. Yes, I love that book. I studied that when yeah. I was in college, actually. Oh, I was nuts for this. I got this when yeah. I was probably eight, and I just and we had we had some some boars in the yard, and so they would, I I try to lasso them and play Tarzan. They chase me around the bamboo thicket and stuff like that. I um, could probably say a lot of my my current day obsession with the kind of stuff that I'm naturally drawn to, and even my art style, my mom would always buy us books. She would never really buy us toys. We were four kids, and we weren't particularly, you know, we weren't the richest out there. So she's like, you can either share this one toy we're going to go buy, or I can buy you whatever books you want. She would never spare a dollar for a book. So yeah. she got us this thing. It was called the Great Illustrated Classics. They were like a pack of 50 white hardcover books that you could Ooh. buy like in bulk. And they were essentially, um, they were essentially like large, what's it called? Uh, it was like a larger font, you know, more spaced out. So it's like easier to read when, you know, you're a third grader or fourth grader or whatever. And now, they would just be like- Are these the, the, the facing page illustration books? So they would be story on one side and a page like an illustration on the other and it yeah, would the, be the black and white ones yeah yeah yeah, I yeah, had some yeah. so they were, were fantastic and they're they so were, richly they were like kind of squarish yeah yeah they're like white hardcover yeah. books and they were like the the classic literature so you had you know your um count of monte cristo your mm -hmm. edgar Allan poe your uh just your, your lancelot books so i i read yeah. a lot of like those those old classics and they, they had it in like slightly easier it was easier language, but it didn't sound condescending. Like when I was at that yeah. age, I really felt like I was reading the real the real deal. And then I yeah. went back to look at them when I was older. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't I, some genius reading Edgar Allan Poe at at fourth grade. <laughs> yeah, no, those were those were huge for me. Yeah. yeah, but the the downside with them, and I didn't really realize this until I was an adult, is that as a result of reading those books. Mm -hmm. I opted to not read the real versions. Yes, and mm -hmm. did myself a real disservice because when I started reading those real versions, the big one being Three Musketeers. Yep, I remember that one. It's it's now my probably my favorite novel, mm -hmm. um, and I've reread it. Well, second favorite novel, but I've reread it a couple of times since then. And I didn't pick it up as until I was an adult because I was like, well, I read this. I know I've the seen book. That. I know the story. <laughs> like, why do I need to read the book? Yeah. Um, it's so good and I wonder how many of those books that I you know that I read that I haven't read like I never actually read Prisoner of Zenda I just know the yeah. version I never and and they were heavy books like we had Tale of Two Cities and a lot of these like the themes are going right over my head I was like this looks sad 
Yeah. You know, I'm we, I'm like 11 reading Tale of Two Cities, and I was like, he looks depressed. Okay, and throw that one over. Go on to the next book. The other the other ones I had, which my dad got for me at a bookstore, mm-hmm. um, and they were uh, they were a um, dollar twenty five a piece. I mm-hmm. think is that right? No, they were $1.95 a piece, but at Eckerd's, which is a drugstore that I believe is no longer in existence, um, they were, they were I think they were at one point two for a dollar, and so he picked up a bunch, but they were these, like, super thin mm-hmm. um, little black and white. Oh, I know those books. Products. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh my and gosh. so I was nuts for these two. Any that had a sword on the cover, yeah. I was all about. So, like, <laughs> yep. Um, or pirates or anything like that, but I, I, I wanted, I wanted sword books. Like that's all I wanted was sword books, and they were, they were uh, infrequent. Um, we, so that's what I wanted to do when I first started out. Everybody mm-hmm. had swords in all my books. <laughs> I mean, that's where I'm at right now. Let's see if it changes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable where I am, but I'm ex- probably maybe I'll get sick of it after yeah. I'm done with Squire. We'll see what else is out there. Uh, but it, it's kind of funny. It's like whenever I turn in. Um, sketches to a client or something and especially if the if the prompt is really open-ended i like agonize over all the different ideas i have and then i'll look at what i've come up with at the end and i'm like girl with a sword (laughs) sword girl yeah (laughs) you it's funny how it's like you think you're coming up with something totally new and refreshing and you're looking at new references but you're gonna ultimately go back to your roots yeah Mm -hmm. well it's it's, uh, I know at, at when it was nearing 10 your time, you were like, we got to wrap it up. <laughs> now it's, it's, it's coming up on 11. So, uh, yeah. we but this wrap has it been up. a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. I really appreciate it. It's great getting thank a chance you. to talk to you. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming on and asking questions and listening to us ramble. For real. <laughs> this is hopefully. I, I want to have you on for another time eventually, uh, well, and we'll pick a, a more specific topic than like history of the world <laughs> to talk oh, about. So, well, and there's one, there's one uh, link that I sent you that because mm-hmm. you know we we did talk about history to a degree, but we didn't get into uh, one part of it. Um, if you, I, I'll I'll post it on Twitter if y'all find me on on Twitter. Um, uh, there's an essay I wrote about historical costume design, and anyway, uh, it, it might be pertinent to y'all's interest. So I'm gonna I'll post that up uh, mm-hmm. tonight. Um, so I'll put a link on there. And thank you for f- wishing me luck, guys. I'm gonna have to finish. I'm gonna tell myself I'm gonna finish that oh, page. Everyone I'm has so to hold sorry. me accountable to it that I'm not just gonna go play Tomb Raider after this because I did just download that game. <laughs> It's a very good game. Uh, and also, you know, it's relevant to this topic, so at least I'll still be on topic. Oh, I've, I've, I've got two of the... I've only played one of them. I've got two um, of the Assassin's Creed games, but I, I have, uh, I've got the, the, what do you call it, the pirate one, mm-hmm. and I've never made it past the, the first big level because I just keep walking around looking at the buildings. So- I'm like... <laughs> like four hours and I'm just like do you know the Assassin's Creed concept I actually looked at how the Assassin's Creed concepts artists did their research Mm because it's really really well done stuff yeah yeah didn't screw around no Uh, and I'm so fascinated like they really did the work like you can you can say whatever you want about the gameplay or about like the the actual narrative of the game but when it comes to staying true to the source material and the number of like it's such a visually rich game. You can't yeah. you can't bullshit that. Yeah. It's yeah. it's so good. I'm I'm gonna just basically be like a screenshotting that game and then I'll I'll file buying it under expenses for this book. I'll charge yeah. it to my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> well good. Well thanks thanks again, Sarah, so very Thank much. You. Page. Thanks again, everybody. And we hope we catch you at another one of these art talk things, another convention that's coming up. We're probably gonna both be at New York Comic Con if anyone out there is also gonna be there, right? Oh yeah, yeah. New York. Woo! It's gonna be fun. I'm already tired thinking it'll, about it. It'll be my first year tabling at New York. I've, Same I've, here. Done, I've done uh, signings of publishers and stuff before, yeah. but I've never gotten up the gumption to have a table. So this is my I'm first year as well. You're driving? 
I'm driving. Why? Because <laughs> um, I got a bunch of stuff. I'm like, if I'm tabling, I want to bring all my stuff. Fine. Um, I so I've, I have no idea how the marshalling yard works. I assume I have to park somewhere in New Jersey. We'll figure it out. Best of luck. Let me know Ooh, if you need any help with problem. anything. We're going to probably be there a couple days ahead of time. Okay. Uh, but yeah, good night, everybody. Or good morning. Good I don't know where you guys are. <laughs> all right. Bye.